And we are live. What's up, Kim? How are you doing? Oh, all right. Um, Great to have you here. A really, little under the weather. Nothing that nothing that uh, coffee can't uh, address. There you go. That's what we do here. We drink lots of coffee, and we talk about life and music and guitars. And we were like rapping for like a good solid 10, 15 minutes before we went, hey, maybe we should <laughs> turn on the, the stream. <laughs> I think we were mostly, yeah, mostly just catching up. And then I realized like, oh, we've gone beyond catching up. We're we're, we're dipping into anecdotes now. Yeah, totally. Like share some of these. We should. We should. So the last time I saw you was 2013 at the after party following the uh, live at the artist and Wiltern show taping, I think. And um, but you and I actually met. You remember when we when we originally met? It was two thousand nine in Seattle. You came, yeah, through. yeah. You know, I, I think it was at the Showbox Soto. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you, you came backstage. You, you guys are playing. Uh, Chris is playing the Showbox Soto, and I'm pretty sure I went down there with Chris DeGarmo. Uh, yeah, from Queens, right? And uh, you came up and said hi. And I recognized you for being on stage. And then Chris, I think, introduced me. He said, this is my guitarist, Pete. Yeah. He's spoken highly about you ever, ever since. You know, whenever you would come up or uh, guitar conversations would come up, he'd reference you. Um, he learned a lot about guitar and, and uh, engineering issues with guitarists from, you know, playing with... Uh, either me or, or or tom morello or you and those or alan johannes of course ended up ended up uh, playing guitar and producing um you sure. yeah yeah i loved his passion for uh for guitar like as a student he was always uh like wanting to learn more and and he was very self-deprecating about his guitar player. i thought he was a great guitar player like in all his yeah life. he got really good um yeah. it, it's his i would it's weird. I was thinking about this recently. I think his strength as a guitarist, besides his ear, was his uh, his right elbow, hmm. which, as a rhythm guitarist, he's bringing his his uh, drum sensibilities to to his guitar playing. His right elbow and his right foot. He had a, the right foot, you know, kicking out the time, and the and the and the and the right elbow accompanying yeah. him while singing. So that's a, that's an interesting thing to to touch on is actually like like there's no better uh example of a band chemistry to me than Soundgarden like the the sum of the parts was so cool and everybody's shone through s talent you know and what they brought to the party shone through so much and I just wonder like your perspective on that and maybe as it relates to guitar too like you, wh what do you think everybody's individual contributions were and the differences between your playing and and Chris's playing um I have to I have to throw Ben's playing in there too because yeah. uh, Ben's style was so unique, and yeah. everybody in the band was self taught as as guitars. Uh, well, Ben, Matt, Chris, and myself. Hero plays more guitar now, but back in the day, he primarily played the four strings. You know, and, uh, but yeah. in the early days. I was the only guitarist and Chris was our drummer. So right. so the as a guitar band that the the band's identity as a guitar band was pretty much being built and established with the songs that uh we were coming up with then and and the with Hero added a lot to that because he was writing a lot of the songs on bass and so then I'd have to adapt my guitar playing to uh to accommodate dynamics around a bass room that Hero may have written. And so I started playing more of that sort of loud, soft sort of stuff, but also other dynamics where you play a, a, a line, you know, this, uh, uh, just play a linear line, you know, on, on one string or so, and then, then, then play the same part in a, in, with a different, in a different vocal section, perhaps arpeggiated. You know, or mm. with power chords. I liked avoiding power chords in the early days because I played too much of that in my previous bands. And mm. So I was trying to avoid doing the Ramones, ACDC, uh, punk rock thing or, or, or a power chord metal thing. But yeah. um, 
Chris moved over to vocals and he had enough presence and charisma that his voice and his holding the mic was was significant um, presence. Yeah, he might stalk like a panther around the uh, stage, maybe bang the mic to to emphasize uh, a rhythm. That's his drummer sensibilities coming out, and he was he knew how to play guitar you know, well enough to write some interesting riffs, uh, but he wasn't comfortable enough playing live. But then we had some friends who had two guitar bands, like Green River and then right. Mother Love Bone, and they found a strength in the two guitars. Uh, as our songwriting advanced, we started using more uh, power chords and more uh, you know, cowboy chords. Uh, Chris wrote a lot with the cowboy chords initially, and uh, uh, I, I think mostly because it was easier to accompany vocals, you know, just to play up there. And eventually started writing, you know, power chords. Those are a little bit wider, and if the, the sort of single note and arpeggiated things didn't really need two guitars, but as as the songwriting changed and the sound was filling up, it did need to, um, especially Chris needed the guitar pretty much to support his vocals and to accompany himself with vocals. And it also filled up space where I might go in a meandering solo. Mm. Mm. And generally, guitar solos were of indeterminate length. It's like <laughs> it, it'll it'll stop when either I get bored or Matt gets frustrated, and so he was back in, or I'm just gonna like run out of ideas. I can't hear myself. I'm just gonna go back to the song. Yeah, the 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 rhythm guitar came in handy there uh, I'm not I don't rem recall particularly the initial advantage I don't I obviously it was more than just a prop I mean he had he he, he could uh, handle the, the stage without the guitar but it certainly gave, if you as your sets get longer it's like okay here's the, here's the here's the part of the set where where I'll bring out my guitar and you know and and I'll uh, uh, focus more on the vocal. Yeah, I think, I think I think if we're playing drunken and 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 throwing our guitars around or whatever, or you're more inclined, and you're you're playing in a drop tuning, you're more mm -hmm. likely to bend the strings out of tune or whatever. And you got this really loud bass on one side of the stage and really loud guitar on the other side of the stage and. And perhaps their bashings aren't syncing up tune wise. Well, it was advantageous for Chris to have his amp right behind his head between mm -hmm. the drums and himself, giving him some uh, cue for his vocal, for pitching. I see. Yeah. I, I think that was a primary advantage. If he's trying to orient between the, the screams, feedback, and uh, spontaneous wildness of, of either wing and trying to figure out where does my voice fit hmm. as that reference with a, with his amp or a monitor right behind him. I That's think fascinating that, that you, yeah. you know, that the, the, you say the, the spontaneous, like the, the, the little bit of chaos happening on either wing, because I find that so interesting about you guys. And then right up the middle is Matt and Chris, but what you guys did, that's part of that chemistry to me that, I mean, like you, you mentioned, Ben, the bass, uh, you know, on fourth of july is like a great example i think where it's like how did he think of that part when it you know for those of you guys watching go listen to it if you don't know what i'm talking about it's fourth of july and super unknown the bass is the most crazy unique cool it's like an ogre coming at you you know that uh i wouldn't have thought of that it's yeah, just that, uh, that sort of creeping up the stairs sort of sound at the beginning yeah. of voodoo voodoo <laughs> yeah it's it's incredible it's so, yeah. yeah, he's Ben's definitely got um he definitely uh has this lateral way of approaching songs that adds something that 
just wasn't there. And it, 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 it's something that was implied and Ben would read it and then it bring it in. Sometimes it's out of left field. It's like, wow, where, where, where did that come from? So yeah. those little color parts um, would certainly give the song the character and just kind of just kind of turn it to slightly in a direction or punctuate it in a way that that perhaps you wouldn't anticipate. And it's we're you know we're not we're not conductors or music theorists that would like that would that would intellectually say you know if we add this element it'll do this emotionally. It, it was just a feel thing, and, yeah. and it's, you know, I think some of the sensibilities and inclinations of all the band members would would give a song that kind of weight or eeriness or wit, you know, just kind of that you wouldn't expect that that was different from where the song had started out. Yeah, and I guess th- th- there's there is plenty of examples even later on where you were the guitar player live that w- i mean like outshine and uh beyond the wheel and the, like t- songs like that where chris would put down the guitar and you you would uh yeah right. kristen kristen chris did play outshine um he did track outshine on bad motor finger he did not play any guitar and beyond the wheel on ultra mega okay i'm pretty sure yeah he didn't but yeah it's curious it's i think he, he probably didn't track guitar and beyond the wheel because he knew of the vocal challenges of that song and did not anticipate or expect that he would be playing guitar on it. And it it was stylistically, Beyond the Wheel was so stylistically um, my approach that for me to just go ahead and double double that made sense. And plus I was in our early days where most of the guitar tracking was was me. Um, as, As the songs, yeah, as I said, as the songs, changed and, and and we started writing things that were suitable for two guitars then it became more prevalent that we that we would arrange uh, to accommodate that and i think yeah. like i said some of that was influenced from from our from our friends bands that had two guitars most of our friends bands are one guitar bands like you know malfunction and and the melvins and yeah. um Alice in Chains, but then you had Green River, Love Bone, Pearl Jam, and uh, Mud Honey. That whole tradition, those guys, the Green River guys, they always had two guitars. Yeah, uh, even Nirvana was pretty much a one guitar band until they got pretty big, and you know, they Pat came in by their sound. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I mean, the progression of your band is so fascinating to me. Um, moving you know, say forward to super unknown where a good friend of mine said to me that he thought that was the sound of a band arriving. And I thought that was a really interesting uh, perspective, just like reaching a full, crazy full potential um, with where it ended up with what each of you were doing. And it's just such an incredible record. You know, I say it's the Sergeant Peppers of the nineties. That's what I was. <laughs> <laughs> I think I joked around in interviews while we were working on the record and referred to it as the uh, heavy metal white album <laughs> just partly because of the variety of, of the material yeah uh, you, we we tended to write heavier guitar riffs and then this album had you know fell on black days and black hole sun both songs that were a little bit more i don't know how you describe them it's a little bit you're know, just a little bit more uh, laid back in mm-hmm. In, in its energy it wasn't they were they were a little bit more oriented toward vocal accompaniment and not not riffing yeah they, they were definitely radio friendly but they were not not soundgarden songs the tone and feel of the lyrics and the melody and even that ambience that was present in the guitar was very soundgarden and had it not been we wouldn't have done them there there were a number of songs that didn't that didn't you know, make that record or or every record because mm-hmm. they either seemed just a little bit too poppy or or the the elements which we would recognize in ourselves weren't present. You know, collect- oh. That's so interesting. I mean, so what's your memory of that? Like maybe hearing I had a conversation with Michael Beinhorn actually about Black Hole Sun and about when that song came in, Chris came in with that one day and I mean, do, do you kind of remember tracking that and maybe listening to a playback for the first time and feeling like, 
oh, this is interesting. Or, or it's yeah, I, I think there's probably blurry memories about. I've read a few uh, um, uh, descriptions about about that song coming into existence, and I've had a lot of people on our end. Uh, their memories contradict some of the testimony that's been written out there. Mm. Obviously, it's it's a significant song. It's our biggest hit, so people are going to. It's going to have different. Uh, people are going to recall different things about how that song came to came to be, and uh, as we know it, and there's some pretty clear things about its inception. I mean, Chris Chris had demoed it at some point, brought it to us, and. I remember the initial reactions were that's that's a really great and catchy song and then the next thought was how does it does it fit as a sound garden song and i think one of the things that that uh beinhorn had commented on was if we do that song then it is a sound garden song because we'll give our voice to it we will give our personalities and our you know both those little things that ben would do or i would do or chris would do or even matt just to kind of just to, just his selection in terms of, of fills and attack that's going to give it that personality so when you hear the demo you'd think wow it's definitely there's something about that's radio friendly yet it's not it's still dark it's 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 still it has a beauty, it has a dark beauty, it has a psychedelic um, element to it, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit tilted off, and it's a yeah. little bit, you know, it, it, it does have, it does have, it, it has that unsettling feel that you might find in, in Beyond the Wheel or, or, or Incessant Mace or, or, you know, even, even Rusty Cage or, or Slaves and Bulldozers. So, it had that element, and I can't put my, I wish I could put my finger on it, but it, it's probably in the vocal melody. It's probably, it's probably in the, uh, the, the chords that Chris chose and voiced. But we knew that it wasn't typical of the kind of guitar heavy riff oriented song that we, had been releasing you know for years yeah but we knew it was still us and and we knew that it was kind of crossing into this other territory that that it was uh kind of radio or radio friendly in a really bizarre way like i had no i, I did not get that vibe from outshine i did not get that vibe from from jesus christ posed or uh, even rusty cage yeah, bad motor finger. But Black Hole Sun was um, was a fairly obvious one. I mean, Hero came back, came by the studio. We were at Avast um, Studios rehearsing and listening to demos and writing. And Hero came by to say hi, and we played that Chris's demo for him. Um, I don't know if we played Chris's demo for him or if if we had attempted to learn the song and might have had some roughs but hero heard it and said and the first thing out of his mouth was oh my god he goes that's your hit hero does he's not an a r guy he doesn't <laughs> talk that way and and he said oh my god that's your hit and this is a musician that we all trust and admire yeah and, and he's somewhat of a cynic so he could have said he could have like smirked and said I see you're going down that road now, guys. <laughs> he, didn't. he said, "Oh my God, that's your hit. That's that song's obviously real strong." So, um, this is all before Beinhorn ever came into the picture. By the way, that's left out of the narrative that I often read. Um, okay, it, this we were we were uh, because we were we were going out. We were doing some writing and rehearsing at a vast, and then eventually. For, for uh super unknown we did pre-production in a different rehearsal studio uh we went from uh, north seattle down to downtown and we were rehearsing at a place of pearl jam their rehearsal studios underneath a underneath an art gallery 
Okay. And we did some pre-production for Super Unknown there with Beinhorn present, and then uh, into into Studio X. But there was stuff going on and writing and sharing uh, prior to that, um, prior to our, you know, presenting these songs to potential producer. I see. So that song that song had already been chosen. Um, be, okay. Before before uh, we there, there was already you know a good handful or more songs that had been chosen to be on the record before the producer came into the picture and that was that was one of them well, it's it's just a really interesting period where it must have been fascinating to discover that you could be uh Soundgarden and 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 yet be branching out in these ways like uh, i mean i reference fourth of july again because it's so heavy but it's so darkly beautiful at the same time and melancholy that's such a incredible place to arrive and i feel like even you know then going forward to down on the upside with um songs like zero chance and you know, oh, yeah. overfloater like i mean they had a similar dark beauty that was like uh but still so heavy and powerful you know so i just love that you're, you're right there's a fourth of july in many ways maybe paradigmatic of our of our style and song you described it right there just psychedelic dark and beautiful and melancholic. These are all components of our personalities, of our material, of our aesthetic. Going back from the beginning, I mean, we, we peppered it with, uh, in the early days, with some snark and wit. We peppered it with, with visceral um, components. Certainly a song like Rusty Cage is, is a very visceral song. Yeah. Uh, like you might get from you know, a more percussive and, and, and forward pushing uh, style of music, like something you might hear in like thrash or, 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 or uh, in metal, metal in general. <laughs> dance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's probably, I guess, not very many guys uh, that got to stand on stage next to Chris Cornell and play rusty cage, <laughs> but I got to do that. And I got to thank you for, uh, you know, cause I mean that riff and the, uh, it, uh, that was so fun. I mean, to be able to go up there and Jesus Christ pose and slaves and bulldozers, I mean, to do that stuff. And it actually expanded once I had to go learn some of those things, you know, I mean, it's simple th things, but so important to the sound. Like, for example, the way that you would play riffs uh, that were heavy up, you know, drop tuned riffs, but up around the 12th fret or the 15th fret of Slaves and Bulldozers, the way you would yeah. use the low string, whereas a lot of people would play them down here, you know, but it, yeah. I discovered, oh, no, it's up here. Yeah. Because it's bendy. It's, 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 it, you know, <laughs> the string's a little bit looser and bendy and, so yeah, it has a, it's a slightly different timber, you know. It's, it's a little bit. It's it's a it's slightly darker, thicker string. It's a little bit looser. Yeah. So ending up there, you're, you're you're kind of pulling it sharp. It's a little bit wobbly, but that's that. But there's something kind of just just a little bit touched about that. You know? Yeah, and I mean the the drop uh, rusty cage. I mean, how did you? You did so many interesting tunies, but let's just take the drop B. Yeah, that was difficult. Uh, uh, Chris, Chris, so he wrote that in, in in drop D. The E, you know, it's, we've done a lot of things in drop D. Yeah. We had read about Metallica doing things in, in like down to C and some B. So Chris dropped from D down another, what, what three steps, uh, half steps. Is that right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, uh, down to B. Yeah. yeah. To uh, it, it changes the position of the octave. For, you know, for one, when when you're when you're drop D, the the octaves on on the same fret. Just you just jump a string. You can make that 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 a uh, power five chord. Yeah. With, e. with rusty cage drop to B, you're now you just you're on the E and A string, and the octave is just that you know. What would normally be the five, the one, right? Set one, two, yeah. Yeah, you get the, uh, oh, I've got your. Get yeah, the one and the five. Would, <laughs> yeah, but now you're at the octave. And so, so the octave was, was, was proximal. And, be, and because it's proximal, yeah, it's really easy to play that. It's much easier to play that, that intro part where you just kind of, you know, this, this sliding up and hitting the octave and coming back down. Yeah. 
So that was a really cool thing. Uh, would, would Chris drop the B to start? That's the first, one of the first things you do if you change the the tunings of your guitars. Just just establish where the octave is, and then you can build, you know, around there. So that that is a very convenient way to to have the octaves together. But it caused another problem. The string was so damn loose and floppy. It's like just just you have to be really. Uh, and when, when Chris started showing it to us, it's like you gotta like really be on it and just don't bend that. It's gonna bend the strings, are gonna bend. <laughs> it's gonna be real easy to bend it, bend it out. So we immediately started using a heavier gauge string just for the just for the E, yeah, to, to try to keep it in tune. And that, and, but eventually it got to the point where. We were so accustomed to playing that just by sliding you know, the whole step up and hitting the octave and sliding back down that we weren't knocking it out of tune as much. And so we could use, you know, a regular regular set of strings that we were comfortable with. But it, it was a problem initially. There was also a problem yeah. with Fourth of July. Oh yeah, solo tuned. Um yeah, we didn't, I was play, we didn't play it live because even if one of us could keep it in tune relatively to our fretboard, we would turn around and probably be out with the other guitarist uh, or with the bass or 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 or, or with Ben. It the, that song could have been served by only having one guitar and one bass. It'd just be you know just be that much easier to pitch. Yeah I see what you mean and, and to maintain it. But it kind of required two guitars even though we were playing the same part just it's just the chorusing of the uh the detuned guitars just it was just a weird murky uh yeah blur it added to that it added to the psychedelia without traditional elements like our arpeggios or choruses or or eastern flares it was just that that smushiness of, of uh Two guitars playing the same down tuned chords a wide pitch and it's a fine line right like because it yeah. can be just out and it's cool and then if it's yeah. too far it's like uh where are yeah. we, uh, um i loved i mean like my wave too is another great uh uh you know we're used to it was f's and c's right all the way across i think it's right? e's and b's i mean e's and b's, b's, yeah. b, 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 oh, yeah. b, b. i just did an interview with um oh good god uh, with the guitar mag, I'm gonna have to call him and correct him. He, there were a few different tunings that he was reading off to me, and they weren't right. You know, I say, no, no, that's not right. You got that from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few internet descriptions of the My Wave Day I Try to Live tunings that are wrong, and and, and but they per you know they they stay there, and I keep they they're kind of ingrained, and, and I keep getting interviewed about them. But I, I, my guitar tech sent me the uh, uh, little PDF of all the songs and all the different tunings because they started getting mixed up in my head, especially since we haven't played them in years. And now I have to contact him and correct them on at least two different tunings. Yeah. Did you did you use uh, on that tuning? Because I know the two, the sixth and the fifth string would both be tuned to E. Then did yeah. you actually put like a sixth string gauge on the? For for the fifth string as well, or would you have just used kind of like no? But it's it is it is possible we use you know um, bottom heavy you know top light. Oh. I know we did that for a few different guitars. I think we did bottom heavy top light for Fourth of July. We might have done that for some of the E E B B B E tunings. Yeah. I don't recall those, those things would change. You know, like like I said, like with. In the case of Rusty Cage, we use a heavier gauge. Um, but then at some point, our acquaintance with you know, performing that song was ingrained enough that we could uh, deal with reg with a more familiar gauge, a more comfortable gauge of string. So it, yeah. it very likely might have used a slightly heavier gauge A string. We should talk about your guitar here, because this is kind of what brought us together today. You've come out with your own uh guild uh s100 and there's two different versions of it right and yeah i'm so curious about your initial like how you started playing these guitars where you would have found like maybe the first one and then sort of your relationship with them over the years 
The first one was, it really kind of met a financial need. It, it was, I was 18 and I wish I could remember what happened to my original electric. It was, it was a fire engine red encore strat copy. <laughs> and I'm trying to remember why I was in the need, you know, why I was in the market for another guitar. And it may have been something as simple as, you know, I needed, I needed money because you know, if you're 18, you've graduated high school, you have expenses like gasoline and, um, I think I had a girlfriend, so that means uh, you know, movies and <laughs> right. <laughs> and, dinner. and I probably developed a smoking habit when I was eighteen, and you need, need to set aside some money for cigarettes and beer and coffee and stuff. So <laughs> I was not a big coffee drinker, but you know, got to buy coffee for other people. So <laughs> I remember a period of time where I sold some albums just to like and some books just to get some cash. And I might, I may have sold my guitar because I wasn't in a band and you know, I, I just figured I'd get another one at some point. But anyways, I was in the market for a guitar. I can't believe that I would have sold my guitar and not had one for a period. But I went to a used store and looked around at various guitars and you know, my experience was limited. You know, I could play Ramones and Sex Pistol songs. I wasn't, this is Chicago. This is where I grew up. So I, I wasn't versed in blues riffs and I wasn't versed in Southern rock riffs. Believe it or not, those were the two things that were, that were kind of huge in the suburbs of Chicago. Everyone was schooled on blues and, and Southern rock and boogie. Uh, it was, the, it was the seventies and it was the Midwest. So I, I couldn't play like that. I, I, you know, I was I was into punk rock and and then some uh, straightforward uh, uh, power chord metal. So the guys directed me towards Les Pauls and Strats, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, right? How much is that? You know, hey, that's what that, that's what the guitars in Aerosmith plays. Hey, that's what Ace Freely plays. You know, <laughs> and there is there's way too expensive and. And part of me thought, I'm, I'm not that guy anyway. Mm. I, I, even if I could afford it, it's like, that's like this professional thing someone's going to take to kinks and minds and play, you know, um, you know, Blind Arvella Gray and, 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 and Howling Wolf riffs. And I just need something that sounds good with a fuzz box. <laughs> cool. And so he directed me toward, uh, you know, he said, well, here's some used guitars. And he showed me this guild, and I think it was, it was like, it might have been three hundred twenty or two hundred thirty bucks, one of the two. It was, it was definitely more affordable. And I knew very little about guild. I'd heard the name, and and the guy explained to me that they're definitely comparable to Gibson's. He goes, "There's a difference." He goes, "Guild doesn't do endorsements." He goes, "Gibson and Fender do endorsements mm. deals. You know, they so they're endorsing guitars, so you see their names." all over the guitar magazines and the rock magazines and, and people use them on tour. Guild is better known for their acoustic line, but their electric line is, is not as developed, is not as broad as, as Gibson or Fender, but the, the sales guy, um, really tried to convince me that, that they're, they're of similar quality that they're both, regarded um guitar manufacturers sure that the difference really was in the price range and stuff really was in their relationship with uh um branding yeah so i, I took that i took that chance and bought the guitar and i, I it was incredibly easy to play it, it's it's you know, i was used to a knockoff strat copy and and it was this i could play those Ramones power chords quickly and easily and um, what little leads I knew how to play were it just it just felt really comfortable the neck seemed accessible and fast and it I remember the pickups are somewhat hot so when I went to go jam with people they were they were suitably loud and mm. 
it kind of got that screamy sort of feedbacky thing going, which just teetering on the edge of falling apart. And I love that, you know, yeah. with that's kind of a component of the music I like listening to. It sounds like you found the perfect guitar. Like it, yeah, it, it did, but I, I, I wasn't, I hadn't really developed my, any, any style beyond just my interests. Hmm. So this guitar that has its own personality and characteristics, sort of, I kind of grew to fit that glove, you know, and, sure. and so my my style and the way I played really ended up taking advantage of the peculiarities of the guitar, and and, and the guitar itself um, accommodated my interests and my abilities, and so as I grew. As a, as a player and learn more, uh, it was really developing my familiarity and relationship and comfort with this guitar. It's really fascinating. I mean, there's similarities with them with, with an instrument like, say, an SG or something, but there's real significant differences like the, the tailpiece. And yeah. I know that you would utilize the strings behind the tailpiece yeah. uh, and do things that, you know, you could probably kind of only do on this instrument. Yeah, and on it, there, there's a slight difference between the the import and the domestic model. The domestic model is a little bit more similar to the classic uh, guitars in, in that tailpiece space. Yeah, and, you know, I didn't, I wasn't looking to to play something that I thought was off grid or or you know outside the rules. I was still young. I mean, I was still oriented towards obeying the rules. This is how you play guitar. This is how a chord looks. This is how the chord position should be. This is a scale. This is how the scale should be. I mean, I'm trying to learn things, so I am going about it by the book and painting within, you know, uh, painting within the lines, coloring within the, in the lines. That's because yeah. I'm learning. I'm not, I have no inclination to doing things sideways. I have every inclination to, to, uh, you know, conforming to is that is established by people who are far better, far better at understanding this instrument than I am. So I'm learning these things, and that's what I'm doing. But then these peculiar these peculiarities of the guitar just inadvertently come out, just sure, either either by just through jamming or just farting around. And my initial thoughts were that's a mistake. That's me playing sloppy avoid that you know watch your right hand don't hit beneath the bridge it's going to sound but eventually you know you get friends and say what was that how'd you do that and, <laughs> oh I, my, my hand just you know i accidentally hit you know this or whatever they were that sounded weird it sounded kind of cool so, yeah yeah i won't do it again i promise <laughs> <laughs> no 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 it's awesome <laughs> so I, I started learning the, the, the qualities and parameters of the guitar and really it was ultimately when i started playing with chris and hero it was the best situation i'd ever been in i mean those kinds of things were encouraged by hero and by chris and and the kind of music we were listening to then sort of opened the door for my not thinking that was a mistake, you know, not, not trying to avoid these unwanted noises or sounds, these, these things that didn't fit in the scale or, or weren't particularly musical. They now became a component of the music, yeah. uh, not traditionally in, in the way that you would write out music, but in, in the, in, they became components of, of a song or the way you might record it or the way you might perform it. And, I think it's because I I notice it with uh, with a few bands. One in particular, a band called Bauhaus. Yeah. Uh, Dan Daniel Ash, the guitarist from Bauhaus, was was uh, I, I we have pretty good regard for that album in the flat field, and you know, Hero and Chris love that record. I remember Hero was really in the Susie and the Banshees, and and you know uh, we were turning Chris off. Chris is Chris is younger, and um, he hadn't gotten into too many indie or underground records, so 
Hero and I were turning them on to, you know, a lot of some some post punk industrial goth from from the UK and then some American hardcore. Yeah. As a drummer and as a musician and as a songwriter, he immediately knew the value of all these interesting approaches to songwriting and playing. And so and he was already open towards uh, this kind of exploration, something he probably learned from the Beatles or, or Zeppelin, you know, and, and then starting to see bands that were that were taking these kinds of risks were was encouraging to to him and to all of us. Yeah. So, and after learning that with Bauhaus, you go back and you say, "Oh yeah, you know, this some of this stuff is occurring in Zeppelin songs, you know, but they're often overlooked." Right. Or you'd read, you know, did yeah. Jimmy Page intend to do that? Did he make a mistake here? You know, it's like, and all those things that you wondered were were uh, production errors or performance errors are all these charming components of uh, performance and, and composition that... it's such a huge point man i mean i f i feel like that the time when you guys were rising and you know becoming what you became you know was such a special time in music um chris told me a story once about you guys it was around 88 coming to la and uh going to a, a meeting at geffen and i remember this i got to la in the 90s so it's a similar time and i remember it's the time of the massive record deal and everybody in the la scene or whatever just trying to get signed like people would do anything to get signed and okay. chris is recounting the story was uh well the first <laughs> There's a, there's a funny aspect to it. He said, we were walking down Sunset Boulevard towards the, I can picture this, you know, walking towards Geffen, going past Tower Records. I know this story. <laughs> Do you know the story? <laughs> I've never seen that you tell the story. No, uh, no, no, no. You, no, no, you tell it. it, it it's hilarious. Go ahead. Okay, well, it, this is his recounting of it to be. It was you're walking down the street. Here's Soundgarden. It's 88, and you're walking down the one side of the street. Across the street is Tower Records, and there's a big commotion going on, and it's a, it's, there's a mountain that's been built, like a fake mountain on top of Tower Records. And what it is, it's an album release party for Dave Lee Ross' Skyscraper album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and that there's just all this hubbub going on uh, over there and stuff and here you guys are walking down the other side of this band from seattle that in a few years would just become part of a movement that kind of took the whole sunset strip down but anyways um i just love the story because then you get to geffen and they say oh we want to do this we want to do that we want to you know and then you guys kind of said yeah we think we're good we're gonna go back to seattle no thanks <laughs> <laughs> i love the story it's this, it's it's totally true. Um, there's my my uh, uh, I think we'd already had our meeting with Gaff, and there, there's a few different trips down Sunset that that I recall, and I don't remember if they happened on the same day or, or different days, but that was that was pretty hilarious because yeah, David Lee Roth was climbing Tower Records on Sunset <laughs> in uh, whatever uh, rock climbing, mountain climbing gear, and we were walking west on west on sunset and there were just all the crowds everyone on sunset was walking the opposite direction everyone <laughs> was walking east towards uh, the tower on sunset i mean we ran into a um uh what's his name uh uh, uh the vice president of gaffin and Stacey's name ed was it ed or, uh coming the other direction he's with joni mitchell and so we saw the VP of Geffen and Joni Mitchell. He stopped, said hi, introduced us to Joni Mitchell. And then <laughs> these fans, like they're all heading east. And then we're, these guys ask us, hey, are you going to go? Are you going to head down the tower? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and we're, it's just this huge crowd. And we just kept looking at everyone and, and hear these. Idiots in, in ripped up jeans from Seattle kind of walk along. Chris turns and looks at me. He goes, "Do you realize we're the only people walking in this?" <laughs> Which is a pretty big metaphor for. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing when you think about it. Preface: I got it. I got a full disclaimer. I'm a huge Van Halen fan, so it's like, love gay, huge. love dead, oh, but no, but it's a totally. funny metaphor. <laughs> for seattle and what happened I, yeah we just wasn't really that much into mountaineering at the time <laughs> <laughs> but we had something in our mind we we, we yeah. had a objective and and when chris said that we just stood there just 
God. I mean, just the look, the look on each other is this is this priceless look. I Chris, Chris had an, an ass wide smile and he's just staring at me. <laughs> We just stopped. We're looking at each other. We couldn't stop laughing. It's like, okay, we got, we got to be somewhere. Let's go. <laughs> I think we already had our meeting with Geffen because okay, when we ran into uh, the VP and uh, Joni Mitchell, we were, we already knew who he was. We'd already had a meeting with him. In, in yeah. Room. I don't know. Were we going back to our hotel or were we meeting with somebody else at Geffen and we're going to go? Uh, I don't know. But – I yeah. just love the idea though of you guys going and going, yeah, we're good. And that and then like when you did finally sign, as Chris sort of recounted it to me, I mean, you can tell me what you think, but I mean, he said we basically had full creative control, artwork, videos, like the whole nine yards to the yeah. point where, you know, uh we didn't even have to let A and R guys in the studio to listen to mixes and stuff. It was like we and I'm just like, God, that is such an amazing time in this business where you could be in a band, get to that point. And have that much, you know, of a machine behind you because we all know it just doesn't, it's not there anymore. It's not the same machine anymore. Uh, what's happened with music and the way it's gone. And I just find it also fascinating that culmination of energy and everything that happened with you guys, like to what happened in the 90s. You, you know what that was? Um, you know, we, had, we had made the Screaming Life album, right? Mm -hmm. EP, uh, EP length uh, debut album. And we started getting interest from some major labels, but at the same time, we we heard that there was some buzz with some other labels, like Slash, which you know, was distributed by a major, uh, in particular SST, which was our favorite label at the time. I mean, our there were so many bands that we dug, but in particular the Minuteman, Meat Puppet, Husker Du, and then of course at some point SST, you know, brought some other bands really we really liked over to the label like you know bad brains and sonic youth and of course we're all black flag fans and saint vitus mm. and at some point there was there was definitely this wish list like god man it'd be so cool to be on sst and the buzz started because the guys we played a show with the guys in saint vitus who were on sst we played with screaming trees we played a gig with uh a band called Das Damen. They're a New York band. They're on SST. And a couple of guys from Das Damen, Lyle Heisen and I forget the other dude, uh, they wrote for college music journals. And this is going to tie back to something we were discussing before you, you turned the, before we passed on. Um, we played this great gig, the Butthole Surfer, St. Vitus, and the U-Men in uh, Tacoma. And the guys at St. Vitus really dug us. Mm. Chris could wail, and our material was heavy. And so the St. Vitus guys talked us up to Greg and Chuck from Black Flag and SST. The Screaming Trees, who are Northwest Brethren, uh, talked us up to uh, Lanigan and Pickerel and the Connor Brothers. They, they're saying great stuff about us to Greg and Chuck at SST. And then Das Damen, this New York band, one of the guys wrote for, I think it was Rock Pool or the College Music Journal, CMJ. And they did a, a review of some of the year's releases and performances. And they, and this is where Chris got this thing. I, I, I'm sorry to our audience out there because this was a, 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 a Sort of a pre-conversation, but we'll, we'll fill you in. The one of the reviews said, "It said uh, worst Led Zeppelin ripoff." It said White Snake, and it said best Led Zeppelin ripoff, Soundgarden. And all we had at that time was the record, uh, "Screaming Light" was out, and then one of the the other college music journal also gave it, you know. Quick but positive uh, uh, review, and that was that was just a funny review in context, and we took it as positive. Mm -hmm. uh, but it refers to that white snake thing that that uh, that Chris had had mentioned. Um, well, the different elements you would have taken from Zeppelin. I mean, when yeah. it, it's a really interesting Soundgarden's uh, influences. Um, never sounded like uh, obvious. Uh, Oh, they're trying to do that. It was more like burden in my hand. It's like there's a lot of Zeppelin in that to me. But, uh, came to mind. but it doesn't sound like 
Zeppelin. It just sounds like, uh, oh, you can, you know, be very creative with a guitar and an alternate tuning and do something like this melodically. And there's a little bit of blues, a little bit of modal. And it's like, and other than that, the similarities end, you know, um, that, that song, man, burned in my hand. That's, that's referencing that, that right elbow of Chris's, you know, as, as a drummer and, uh, and as a rhythm guitar singer, you know, I, I've often commented how, how rhythm guitarists and singers play guitar from their elbow, as opposed to you and I might, are more likely to play from our wrists, you know. True. And yes. Players play from their shoulder and maybe their 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 fingers. Yeah. So, um, rhythm guitars, and I've, I've noticed there's a lot of bands that play guitars and singers like that. He's counting and he's he's accompanying his voice and and keeping aware of the rhythm. So that song "Burden" is so it's so it's just rhythmically strong. It's very it's very that right hand right elbow thing, and it's his his uh experience as a drummer i think you might be covering the mic i'm sorry with the there's because you're found fading a little bit there but is it, is it, can i hear you now oh can you hear yeah that's better yeah oh where is the hell is the mic Let me check this the mystery mic. yeah um how's sorry. that sorry yeah perfect yeah, yeah. so sorry that you were saying that experience as a drummer with the rhythm yeah and and you know i mean Yeah, his and Chris's sensibilities are as a drummer are really good because you know he was he was our original drummer and he was along with Hero and myself, he was very much part of the songwriting tradition that we established by coming up with weird time signatures. Yeah. And he's playing those weird time signatures while trying to fit lyrics and, and melodies over them. Fascinating. So, that yeah. whole, like the way that he could weave together an odd time signature with a melody. I mean, that zero chance, a good example of that to me, where it's just like, how does he write this beautiful melody that ties this? Uh, yeah. You know, and it all makes sense. It was like such a skill. It, zero chance is one of those crazy things that Ben wrote on guitar. That was the fingerings were a little bit, <laughs> they're, they're, they're pretty involved. It's like, why'd you make that chord that way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben's Ben's you know five inches taller than me, so he's <laughs> five or six four. So he's able to make these uh, chords. I'm like, God damn, I can't stretch that way. So Ben yeah. writes music for that, and then Chris goes and winds a beautiful melody around it. It's just incredible. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Those those are really great sensibilities. They're natural. Those are things that are kind of hard to teach. But I think it does come from his his experience as a drummer. So mm -hmm. he's drumming something in five in our early days. You know, Hero writes something, or I write something in five, five, four, or seven, four. So Hero, Chris figures out, you know, the drums, he starts playing along with it. And then he says to us, I think I have lyrics that'll fit that. And we just start laughing. It's like, sure, you got lyrics that are gonna fit that. <laughs> um, he goes, he goes down into his room, we wait a bit, comes back up with some lyrics. He sets it up. All right, starts trying to play the thing, and he's like, uh, uh, he's kind of looking at the paper. He's not singing it; he's just looking at it, just yeah. trying to see if he can count it out. And he would try it, and you know, he, he, we, we we'd start and stop a few times, and because I think this will fit. And he has in his head the meter of the of the vocal line and how yeah. it'll fit with what he already knows he's doing in a tough time signature, and eventually. Oh, I lost you again. Sorry, that's down. Are you going to lost you there again? Uh, there it is. I think you're back. What is can you hear it now? Yeah, I can hear it now. Somewhere where your hand is, maybe or something. I wonder what it is. Yeah, I'm probably moving this thing, keeping it from keeping it from falling. Oh, um, sorry. Anyways, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but my 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 knees are my table right now. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Must be the yeah. Yeah, I, hey, should uh, stop, I should stop wearing furry pants. <laughs> <laughs> but the fashion, <laughs> I'm sure they look cool. Um, I was going to say, you mentioned something I didn't want to uh, lose there, which is that you're saying he went down to his room. Now, he told me a story once about finding houses in Seattle that uh, would need to be refurbished or be they were and you guys would go and kind of say, hey, you'd find the person to own it, say, 
let us work on your house and we'll fix it up, but we stay there for a year and then it'll be rentable or whatever after it. Is that I true? Like, man, those would have been those, those would have been things that hero would solicit. A uh, hero okay. was, um, he was, he was more, um, he was more of a handyman than either Chris or I were. Okay. And, he was more willing to do that. He's also more willing to bargain and, and do that. I could see Hero going in and, and Hero and Chris lived together in at least three different houses that we rehearsed in. Got it. Okay. At least three, maybe four. And I could, so they would look for a place that either had a, that had a basement with the exception of the first place they lived in together, which had an attic, and that's where Soundgarden was born, in an attic above an insurance office. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So they would find a place, and they would look at it. It's like, can we, you know, this be good for rehearsing? Will we bother the neighbors? And then and then Hero would put up, you know, false walls, or they'd get a bunch of mattresses and, 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 and suspend them from against the wall from the ceiling just to kind of try to baffle it and soundproof it get egg cartons just staple them to the ceiling things like that so that was a lot of work that uh hero would do and because they lived there and cool well, chris would, would 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 was doing the work as well um but the foreman was definitely hero it's so interesting you, you know it really um it's a special thing because uh having met him 2007 and then getting a chance to play with him, spent a lot of time with him. Um, he was still like such a, like kind of salt of the earth guy. And I think those stories, when he would relate those to me, it just made me think like, you know, how grounded he was. You, uh, you told a story um, at his service that was incredible to me. And you, you, you got up and you said, uh, he was the kind of guy that never discriminated against anybody. He not even would he discriminate amongst species, you said. And yeah. you proceeded to tell a story about a neighborhood dog, right? But it was Chris's dog. That was became it? a neighborhood dog. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It would have been his dog Bill. There was a <laughs> Rottweiler or, or a Rot mix. And what were the other things I said about? You said that he would, you'd say, what are you doing uh, this weekend or something? And he said, oh, I'm going camping with Bill. <laughs> like he was a guy, but he was, you know. Yeah, oh, it, well, he, it, yeah, Chris had close friendships with his uh, dogs. And, and most of his dogs are either, you know, shepherds or rots. And they're, they're, they're big. And they go camping together with Chris and a couple friends. And they yeah. drink beer. They climb things. And they hang out play the dogs and he was just another buddy they they were very independent you know generally off leash and they do their own things and they'd had their own friends and chris would often comment on how bill has his own friends we were on tour for the past 10 weeks and uh people would drop by it's like can bill come out and play they go take bill camping so so other other friends of chris's or friends of his uh siblings would swing by and we're going on a road trip or we're going we're going camping does bill want to come along and sure bill would hop in the car and go take bill camping and chris, <laughs> chris chris is out with his his uh band of weirdos out in europe or something or on the east coast and you come back it's like yeah bill had a blast you know, <laughs> do this, you do that. and bill was so independent that he just kind of walked around the neighborhood and, and other people in the neighbor in the neighborhood knew him and liked him and liked his company so people would have friends over and bill would come by and go down the block and hang out at some barbecue get some get some food and kind of play with the other dogs and it was pretty cool and, and and chris enjoyed describing bill's independence and the fact that he had a different set of friends than than his master did <laughs> <laughs> engaged in different social activities <laughs> oh, i love it it's so great um well i should take a couple there's there's a whole bunch of people in the chat here and they're asking questions and things and i should uh i should touch on a little bit of that there's some good ones here there's fellow named Ron here says, um, consciously or subconsciously, 
uh, think were grunge or just a rock band. Uh, I mean, like I, I often think about that, like as as this uh, movement and moment in time is happening, were you aware of the shift of what's going on or does it feel just like, well, this is our band and this is what we do? Like, oh, we, we're aware of a particular stylistic identity that was that had uh, that had co- that had come out of you know Seattle probably with with the release of the the recording of the Deep Six album in mm-hmm. we, that was recorded in eighty five released in eighty six and it was clear that there are a number of bands that kind of came out of the indie underground punk movement that were using slower or standard tempos as opposed to hardcore tempos when we started out we we we'd play fast in Mm. standard time or in fives or in sevens we weren't even aware that we were doing that we just we just try to play kind of fast but you know at the same time accommodating vocals chris wasn't he wasn't prone to you know screaming and yelling real fast from behind the drums Mm. in some weird time signature and our interest in the kind of things we're writing and the way we're playing kind of steered away from hardcore and uh the other bands there were some other bands in the scene like particularly the melvins and malfunction that were they're kind of hardcore-ish but malfunction had this sort of leaning toward bands like venom you know merciful Mm. fate yeah and melvins were were just really arty and but they were kind of they're definitely a a punk rock hardcore band and then they kind of slowed down overnight and started doing really heavy trippy weird stuff and that was kind of going on with green river who when when green river formed the conversations that mark and i had prior to the formation of green river or soundgarden were about our interests and influence of by a band like the Stooges, you know, um, I, I remember the Green River guys are really into Tales of Terror. That was a band from mm. a, a punk rock band from LA, uh, Southern California at the time. And I remember Ben Shepard joining in a conversation, probably at a Tales of Terror concert at the Metropolis with Mark Arm and I. And Ben's like, Yeah, do you know what other song has a feel like that? Manic Depression by Hendrix. That's my mm. favorite song right now. Mm. And it's like, Would it be cool to form a band? Where the band was like manic depression by Hendrix. <laughs> that would be cool. And so these are kind of mid tempo, kind of groove and heavier things. And that was kind of what was happening. So we, we knew that this was something that was you know not necessarily going on in other scenes or other cities. We'd read Maximum Rock and Roll, and there, there, there'd be in every issue of Maximum Rock and Roll, uh, fanzine or magazine there'd be a little chapter and scene reports from different states like what's going on in upstate new york what's going on in this town in california what's going on in the midwest and someone would submit what's going on with various bands and people are being very true and allegiant to the punk rock ethos and uh seattle was doing something different and we were very aware of that but we didn't think it was grunge that that's that became some marketing thing yeah. later. That was <laughs> terrible. <laughs> well, all the bands are so different, so it's not fair to, but I guess, you know, at least there was a movement, but yeah. That's it was- correct. That's correct. Uh, the bands became more distinctly different uh, with, with time, uh, but I think we kind of came from a similar place initially. Yeah. We're all at the same shows, watching the same bands. You know. Richard Siri says, uh, Soundgarden is such an important part of my post hair metal listening days in the eighties. Thanks for the rock. I feel the same way. (laughs) I went through a big phase of like, you know, realizing that what was good because I was living in LA. I was like, Oh, this is going away. And then what with what was happening? I was like, this needs to happen. This is good. (laughs) I embrace (laughs) this. This is really good. (laughs) None of us were listening to hair metal with the possible exception of green river and mouth. Green River and, and Mother Love Bone a little bit. I mean, they're borrowing for the those guys kind of dabble in the Aquanet and the, uh, <laughs> the hair dye. But I think they're trying to cross over from their punk rock roots and kind of embracing these other elements. Yeah. But Chris and Hero and I, I mean, it's it's not because we didn't like it. It's 
I didn't get MTV. I, I don't even think I had a TV. Chris and Hero didn't have a TV. Yeah. Well, we did have a TV. It was just broadcast. I, I, I didn't, you know how I got to see our Soundgarden videos on, on TV? How? It was going on tour. It was, <laughs> you, you, if you're lucky, you'd have a hotel that had ESPN and MTV. So you can catch up on all the Mariner scores. And then, and then maybe if you're lucky, you'd see one of your friend's videos. And I didn't have <laughs> TV at home until like 95. That's amazing. We're 94. And so it was totally a hotel experience. I love and it. So I just, I wasn't paying attention to that. I was a college DJ and, and we're constantly getting new records from, from bands around the world that are doing interesting things. And I wow. knew I was aware of bands like Poison and Warrant and, and Motley Crue, by the way, Motley Crue was a band we were aware of. And we, and we, with the, that, you know, the first album, Too Fast for Love, um, we we're totally aware of that. It kind of, it was one of those bands that kind of fit into the punk rock canon. Just yeah, they, they did on that record. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it, it, was, it was initially, I mean, Malfunction, you know, Andy Wood and Kevin Wood, they, they used to play shows and then and Andy would come out dressed up like, you know, Landry, the love master of ceremonies. And he would say, Hello, we are Malfunction, Motley Crew North. <laughs> we are Kiss West Coast. That's so great. And we bring you love from Olympus. <laughs> Kicking in the heaviest, <laughs> craziest. And Kevin was, do you think I'm wild and sloppy as a guitar player? Man, I was probably influenced by Kevin from Malfunction. He would just play as fast as fuck, you know, for the whole set. Just, I mean, the groove and the heavy riff turns out it was coming from Andy on bass with some distortion. And he's playing the heavy riffs. And, and, and his brother, Kevin Wood, it says, <laughs> he, was, they're, they're, he was totally into Venom. And it was just, it was just, it was just trippy as hell. Because you got a guy who's singing these melodies about love and he's dressed up with makeup and everything. And the yeah. riff heavy as fuck and the guitar is just soloing all over the place i loved it what year was this like this would be like you know 82 83 84 okay cool. you know? that's so cool yeah i mean you know even then i think the thing that maybe is different is what was going on in la was becoming so uh just influenced by the industry and so like it was very because i got here in 90 and it was very you had to fit into a certain, you know, and it was the, the antithesis of doing something different and kind of like, and, and, and that's why, that's what I really mean when I say it had to go away and something else had to happen. Cause it was getting really silly. <laughs> you know? yeah, I remember thinking it was like the Partridge family with fuzzy guitars, you know, I, 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 <laughs> that's great. You know, yeah. like distortion boxes and the songs are basically like the Brady kids or, or Partridge family. Um, I mean, there were some yeah. exceptions. I, I remember the guys in Green River, a couple of guys uh, really liked Poison. And so mm -hmm. I remember them talking up that look what the cat dragged in. So I listened to it and it was, it was, it was really cool and catchy in a way that I remember Sweet being, you know, like Sweet Desolation Boulevard. Um, you know, uh, sure. I really liked a lot of early Sweet. So yeah, like like I said, there there there's some dabbling, but I really wasn't I really wasn't acquainted with that material. I was, I was mostly I was getting my music from from uh, you know, either KCMU, which is now KEXP, yeah. or just trading records, just trading a uh, EPs. Punk rock albums in those days were EPs. You know, they're um, yeah, it, it's a it's a way to compete. You know, at at a retail display, it's like you 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 make a you make a six or seven five song album and it's a few dollars cheaper than than the uh than the you know uh, the culture club album or the or the uh, poison album or or whatever there, there's like this there's like this hey this is new band the butthole surfers it's a new right. band it's, it's cheaper you're committing you're not committing to you know a whole hour of blasting out your roommates you're just you're getting a good strong 20 30 minutes when and, you mentioned did you say that you were a uh, college radio dj as well yeah uh so that must be just 82 and 84 84 85 and it was yeah. brief 
you know, I, I was doing too much at the time. I was going to college, going to the University of Washington, working nearly full time, had a new, had a girlfriend and Sal Garden started in 84. And I was, God, and I was DJing occasionally. And I, I lost my regular shift and started up just occasionally filling in for people. Okay. But it was, it was, it wasn't, yeah, it was a thing. And a lot of the, eventually a lot of other people in the Seattle scene started working there. Bruce Pavitt was a DJ at the same station. Uh, John Poneman, hmm. they're both founders, uh, co-founders of Sub Pop. But you know, Mark R from Green River and Mud Honey was, you know, was DJing there. Uh, Ben McMillan from Grunt Truck and Skin Yard was there. There's, there's just a bunch of guys who played in bands who were also ended up DJing there either before or, or during. That's so. really interesting, though, because, I mean, obviously that would be, you know, 82 to 84, and then you're hearing all this new music all the time, and then you're starting yeah. a band. Yeah. Soundguard going 84 it must have been, like, really, like, a uh, just a period of growth. Um, yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Um. Well, that's where I get my stuff, and I'm not like like Richard was acquainted with uh, some of the hair metal stuff in, in the '80s, and like I said, it, I just you know we would hear about it from seeing it on someone's T-shirt. You know, right. someone went to a Cinderella concert, we see the T-shirts the next day. It's like, ah, who's that? It must be one of those bands. You know, <laughs> it's so interesting. And then you you spent some time uh, growing up in Chicago as well, right? Yeah. That's totally, totally where I grew up from age seven to 21. And then, you know, bikes and friends and family there that you stay in contact with. It must have been amazing. Um, I was at your Lollapalooza show in Chicago in 2011. Is that when it was? And uh, that must have been an interesting feeling, like going back to the city where you spent so long and, and playing that that show. Oh, yeah. I had, a, I had a lot of I had some high school friends there and, and friends of the family. That was big show, first time back in years, and right. Yeah, that was. I mean, that was that was a trip. I don't know if the challenge of playing you know, the second sound or second or third Soundgarden show in in eleven or twelve years was the primary stressor, or if it was the nostalgia and sentiment of being in the town I grew up in and seeing a lot of uh, people that I was familiar with as a kid. So it was it was a pretty pretty surreal experience. Definitely, definitely cool. It was it. I mean, I just remember it being a, a great feeling. It was terrific. You know, it's funny because I will say when I saw you in uh, 2009 when you came uh, to the show, uh, and I and I saw you there with uh, with Chris where we were at the Showbox in Seattle. I thought, oh, I think maybe my time might be limited here. <laughs> playing with Chris and then but of course like we were all so like uh, fans and just wanted to see that happen and then to be there I uh, you know at, in Chicago and see you guys actually on stage up there it's it really special it felt really terrific so and thanks it was it, it was a trip it's funny at, at that point in time I thought it was just you know we were playing live and playing a few shows kind of a one-off I, I didn't have a strong sense of commitment you know yeah to be, See back, what happens, right? to be back again so so yeah. I, I didn't, it was it was a lot of fun but um yeah it, it took a it took matt presenting some demos and it, pushing us to go into the studio because he wanted to hear us learn and play these songs he had written oh. it took that experience of being in the studio learning new material to make me realize I, I think this could work. I think we could be a band again. Oh, how interesting. That's awesome. <clears throat> so that would have been <clears throat> late 2010, into okay. early 2011. Before that, we, you know, we, we really just started up our online presence. We got our merch, our merch back together, the fan club. Uh, we had a, we had a web, a web page that became a website. So we, our shared properties and our partnership was kind of being addressed. It had been a, sorely ignored for over a decade, you know, our catalog, our yeah. merch. And it's kind of a bummer, but, you know, we'd, we'd have friends who were having kids and they'd call us and say, 
hey man, I took my daughter to a to a, a store in the mall. We bought I bought a Nirvana shirt. Or, you know, we also we also got an Alice in Chains shirt. But there's no Soundgarden posters or shirts. Oh. We were hearing that from other friends, like the guys in the Presidents or the guys in in uh, in uh, this band or that band or just friends. You know, it's like yeah, I got, our kid is really getting into music now. But we can't find any you know, this. There's no Soundgarden merch. Uh yeah. So we did into that, and then we played a few live shows. Thought, like, okay, now we're entertainers. We're 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 dusting off the guitars and the amps, I suppose, and playing that. But it really was the creative partnership that was pushed by Matt that that really brought out that kind of uh, that that familiarity and, and and that kind of wondrous feeling you get when you're when I was when I'm with for me when I'm with these three guys and. And yeah, the kind of things you share and the ideas you come up with, and then yeah, uh, that's great. It's so special. It's like you know, I remember uh, standing with you during uh, the acoustic part of Chris's set at that show in two thousand nine when I came over and you were watching from the side of the stage and he started playing "Fell on Black Days" and the whole crowd was singing. You know, and I remember your face and you were like, "Wow, like fell on black days." It was it was like. It was you. It was like a moment of pride or something. I don't know. It was really cool. Like, yeah. Seeing your response to, because maybe you hadn't heard that song sung in an environment like that for a long time. It was really yeah. neat. You know. Yeah. De definitely. I I I think I think you're right. There was a a moment of pride and, and recognition. You know, a lot of things had to fall back into place in order to, in in order to have that kind of understanding about you know. Yeah. What it is we did and what it is that that we're that we're missing you know yeah yeah uh just answering what's called some super chats here um this fellow says played let me drown oh this is great played let me drown with you live at the whiskey with joel hookstra's band rock fantasy camp i know you did that a little while ago that rock fantasy yeah. camp thing says great when legends give back and connect with fans that's so cool i yeah. i don't know if that was this past, i did two years in a row and it was a lot of fun. It was really satisfying. I didn't expect that it would be. I thought, I mean, hope I might have been covering up the, the mic again. As a matter of fact, I've done two two different comedy bits, you know, for TV. Okay. Rock and Roll Fantasy Camps. Uh, there was a show called Almost Live based here in Seattle. Um, Joel McHale was a cast member of the show. Uh, John Keister, who was a writer and uh, director, Bill Nye, the science guy, was a. These are all they all came from this show, almost live. Um, and in the '90s, they they wrote a skit, and mm. they corralled me, Dave Grohl, and Mike McCready <laughs> into performing in this skit with the cast members, and it was called Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, something. Um, and they had that the comedians in the show were playing, uh, you know, older, rich, white rock and roll campers who are trying to learn how to rock and, and the comedians <laughs> showing them how to smash a guitar and I'm showing them how to play Black Hole Sun and <laughs> Dave Grohl is, is, uh, is showing them how to play something. And, and so this skit airs and it, it was, it, it lasted on a reruns for about 20 years and basically of the cast and the bands making fun of a rock and roll fantasy camp. And then in 2010, Ben Shepard and I do voice work for uh, the show Metalocalypse, you know, featuring the, the band Death Clock. Right. Who I went to go see back in uh, September here in Seattle. Amazing band. Mm. Uh, just, if, you get a, if, you had a, if you didn't get to see Death Clock, it's, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. But... I I, the, I did voice work for a cartoon episode of Metalocalypse, uh, an episode of the cartoon Metalocalypse that was called Death Camp, and it was, and I played uh, the MC of a rock and roll fantasy camp, and I played a, a a camper as well, and that whole episode kind of you know makes fun of rock and roll fantasy camps in a in a horror sci fi comedy way. Right. And then years later, I'm asked to participate in one. I'm thinking, wow, this is a different context. 
<laughs> was during the pandemic. And there were so many friends of mine that were out of work. I was getting calls from crew crew members of other bands saying, hey, do you know anyone who's going out? Do you know anyone who's working? I was getting yeah. calls from musicians and peers. You know, hey, man, we had to cancel our tour. You know, it'd be, getting a day job was not an option. So there were a lot of musicians and a lot of touring personnel who were put out of work. And then I get this offer to play rock and roll fantasy camp. They, they assure me that it'll be It'll be vetted, it'll be safe, it'll be a good environment. And all I'm looking at is my biography, which is, has me participating in these comic, <laughs> TV comedy sketches, ridiculing rock and roll fantasy camps. And then I turn to my girlfriend and think, well, what? I, I can't justify declining an opportunity to work when people I care about are looking for it. Uh, uh, something be there would be something so dickish to say, you know, nah, you know, I, yeah. I don't, I don't, it's, it, it, yeah, it's just, just weird. So, so I, I felt I should, I should do this. It, it's, it's an opportunity and I should do it out of respect to the people who are looking for work. And I, here's an opportunity I should take it and it ended up being a great experience. I love the, I love the, 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 uh, camp counselors the other the other musician joel hoxtra says that guy's just a great guitar so he's a sweetheart i mean everybody there is yeah. just just great people kind polite supportive encouraging of the of the of the campers and the kids and the and you know there were some old white guys who were doing their fancy and there were a lot of kids and and their guys and their girls and 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 all ethnicities and ages and and genders and i it, it was cool. It was just, yeah, it's pretty special. I mean, I'm sure, um, you know, you get into an environment like that and it's, it's funny what we realize. maybe like, Oh, everybody knows how to do that thing or everybody. And it's like, they don't, you know, and then you've got this unique skill set, and you can give back to people and they're so stoked. Right. I mean, learning something from someone like yourself. Um, and it, it feels good. It's like, you know, it's, it's, a, they get to, they, some of these, especially because it was the middle of the pandemic, there are people who develop their chops and their skills as I did, in, you know, in your bedroom with a, your record player or the radio, just kind of playing along with and or looking yeah. at a little chord book. And yeah, I was that guy who spent five hours a day just noodling on, on the guitar while listening yeah. to the radio. And some of these guys are like that. And maybe they haven't played with other guys in a garage or gotten together with other musicians. Maybe they're just playing, you know, teaching themselves on their laptop or whatever. Or maybe they don't have a way to gauge what it, what their skill set is or their ability is. Yeah. And the fact that they have the courage to do something like this with an audience in mm. front of other you know, uh, players, both professional and amateur, and to and to challenge themselves to take on someone else's material with that person shows uh, <laughs> shows a boldness that either indicates an obliviousness or or, or a great courage. Um, I think it was <laughs> I learned it was primarily the latter, and it, it, was, yeah. it was great to see. That's terrific. I go way back with Joel, by the way. We went to music school together, the same class. So. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, going back That's 30. That's where you got all your chops. You guys are learning all that stuff from the same place. <laughs> <laughs> 32 years ago, I think. But he, uh, yeah, I've got good memories of, of him. He's a great guy. I still see him sometimes. And he is. He really is. Get to catch up. Yeah, he's a good cat. Uh, here's yeah. Matthew. He says, you are by far his favorite guitarist so much that he bought a 97 S 100 and recently got the import version, just like this one here. Cool. Of your signature. That's awesome. Um, are there, were there, he says, were there any songs you wrote that didn't make it on an album? I'm sure there's probably tons of ideas you've had. Yeah, right? there's lots. Uh, I just had this conversation with, uh, this guitar mag. Um, now, since I wasn't, since I'm primarily not writing lyrics, I'm mostly writing uh, music and riffs. You know, here's the A part, here's the B part, here's the C part. If there's no lyrics on it, it's not going to go anywhere. You know, and yeah. it's diff for me. 
uh, the arrangement would come after after lyrics. Now I do write lyrics. I can, and, and my 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 uh, initial bands. I was a primary songwriter back in Chicago, writing lyrics and music. The type of lyrics I wrote would were definitely me at eighteen or college. They're they're not Soundgarden by any stretch of the imagination. The type of songs I was able to fit lyrics on yeah. were simpler power chord, you know, think Ramon stuff or Kiss stuff or, or ACDC stuff. So I'm writing power chord songs and riffs and vocal accompaniment and I'm writing lyrics. I can do that. Yeah. I cannot do what Chris does by any stretch of the imagination, writing something in a, it, it, consistently writing things in sevens and fives and eights. Um, okay, I did write lyrics for Never the Machine Forever, which is in nine. <laughs> and I and whatever, I wrote the lyrics for a non-state actor. But those were those were unusual cases where I had a good feel for where the one was. I'm not a drummer, and I generally don't have an inclination with the lyrics. Uh, so if I were to be in a, if I were to start a band where I'm, where I'm writing something like I did in my early days, it'd be a lot easier for me to wind melodies around. Um, How would that apply to say uh, Third Secret, which you you done? I don't write lyrics for Third Secret. Um, we the, the the singer Jillian um, has that incredible ability to wind a melody around things that uh, that. You know, Matt and I, Bubba Dupree, or Chris Novoselic are coming up with. So, so we're coming up with riffs that are that are. I mean, basically, the stuff's in four, but there's stuff that's not. And mm -hmm. she, she, uh, she has a musical aptitude. I believe she plays. Uh, she plays some stringed instruments and uh, banjo, and she sang with in, in in the band Giants, Giants in the Trees, with Chris Novoselic for many uh, years. And she has that ability to wind a melody around a, a, a curious and non, non a, a riff or musical part, the instrumental part that's not as straightforward. So it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, I think Chris is likely the best I've seen at doing that. From my, from I mean, from what I'm familiar with. Yeah. Um, he's just amazing at that. Um, it's a difficult thing to do, and I chalked it up to not just Chris's ability as a singer, but really his, his ability as a drummer. Yeah, a, that constant rhythm. innate rhythmic sense, and then just yeah. having his vocal skill, right? Being able to, yeah, that putting it all together, it's so yeah. interesting. Um, there's a couple of specific questions I've seen about songs in the chat here. Uh, this uh, fellow's interested in where boot camp came from and the sound, the haunting sound, where how that came to be. Uh, well, so boot camp is a very short, it sounds like a coda, right? Because it is for, for down the upside. It's so beautiful. It's a, it is. So, it, yeah. It's uh, yeah. so Chris wrote that instrumentally. I think I don't know. It's a difficult time remembering this. Often Chris would demo things mm. just because it would present the best foot forward. Um, okay. This is this is I this getting back to the I'm gonna connect this to the other question. Uh, that songs, there are a lot of songs that Matt or I would write, but they're primarily instrumentals. And if they don't have lyrics, they're they just that is riffs or uh, an A and B part floating out there. Chris, on the other hand, would present things. He'd want to present things in its best, you know, best face forward, mm. so that we, the band, would fully understand the idea of the song, so that it'd be, you know, so that it wasn't being rejected on the merits of just a guitar riff, or it wasn't being rejected on the merits of a. Uh, uh, of a production sound or, or, or a mix. He'd want to make sure that all the elements of the songs that he heard were being heard by us so that it was part of a selling point. I see. But this would happen frequently where Chris might, in the early days, he might, uh, when I say early days, uh, like say Rob, Bad Motor Finger, he might 
let's say write five songs and we'd like two or three of them and hmm. and and so he's got the lyrics and, and, and the instrumental, but they don't all make the record because some of it just didn't feel like something I play or they didn't feel like something uh, Ben would play or Hero or or, uh, or whatever. Didn't didn't feel like Soundgarden. Mm -hmm. And, you know, more often than not, Chris would get that. He'd say, like, yeah, you know. Was, I was yeah. going to ask yeah. if that was like, a, if that was kind of like a mutual, you know, come to an awareness that mm, maybe not and like everybody's on the same page or. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't push it like, you know, like I might push a riff or, or Matt might push it like, Hey guys, I really want to do this. You know, Chris wouldn't push it. He did in the earlier days. And I, he learned that from Andy from malfunction and mother love bone, Andy Wood. Mm -hmm. like, you know, just that, that whole idea. I've read this in some interviews, which was attributed this, this is attributed to, uh, a, a producer, but a, it, it wasn't. It, it would, this would be attributed to Chris's relationship with Andy. The idea of writing material and sharing it with the band or fans or the audience and not becoming too attached to it, just generating, become, generating material. And if they don't like it, they don't like it. There's something else they will like. So and that was Andy's attitude. So Andy would Andy would write Andy Wood from Mother Love Bone and Malfunction, Chris's yeah. roommate and very close friend. He would just really prolific. He would sit there on his keyboards or his you know his, his recorder and he'd record just song ideas and little parts here and there or complete songs and he'd document them and give them titles and and a lot of them were really bad, you mm. know. Mm. Some were okay. Some were just brilliant as hell. But his whole point was, I wrote it. I'm just going to record it, document it. They don't like it. They don't like it. If I don't like it, I don't like it. If I don't like it now, maybe I'll like it later. You know what? Yeah. But he, was, he just, just document. Just write it. Don't worry about it. And Chris was more self-conscious. I was very self-conscious. Hero was very self-conscious. Very self-critical. So sometimes we wouldn't even present an idea to a band because... Mm. We, we would second guess ourselves and maybe later it's like oh, someone hears you jamming on a riff that you've had around for a couple of years. Like, what's that? You know, that's really cool. Why, yeah. did, you, why did you show that? Oh, that kind of sucks. No, I don't think it sucks. You know, <laughs> so, so Andy, you know, Chris would do that to himself. It's like, these guys aren't going to like it. You know, uh -huh. like this song. And it was Andy. Guarantee it. I, I I've read a number of things that attribute this to other people and, and to and to producers, but it, it wasn't. It, it is Chris learned this prior to Super Unknown, prior to Bad Motor Finger, prior to Temple of the Dog. It, it was you know when we lost Andy, uh, Chris took into account the beauty of this person and his creativity and his and the fact that he's prolific and the and the fact that he's. He's regarded and revered and missed, and and that itself was motivated Chris in two ways. One was to talk to me about you know, maybe we should ask Ben to join the band because he's mm. from the same neighborhood in town that Andy is. He knows a lot of these same guys, and he kind of comes out of left field like Andy does. And he's really prolific, and, and he's a friend of yours, and you're good friends of Ben's family. It's like, yeah, let's let's do that. And then the second thing was. Chris became really prolific. And then Temple of the Dog and Bad Motor Finger. Because even if the guys in Soundgarden maybe don't like that one song, it's like it makes sense in this other idea, you know, the Temple of the Dog thing. You know? How fascinating that is. I mean, because it was both right around the same time, right? I mean, both those records were recorded like consecutively. Yeah. 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 They're, they were released. Uh, Temple of the Dog was released first. It didn't do very well initially. Um, uh, it sold like sixty thousand, but they re reissued it like a like within a year, a year later, on the heels of Pearl Jam uh, ascending. When Pearl Jam started going through the roof, then A and M decided, "Hey, you know those guys are playing on this record, and Eddie's doing this duet with Chris. Let's let's reissue this." And and yeah. at the time. I do remember this at the time we were in Europe on tour and some of our label guys came out to meet with us and say, Hey, we're thinking about doing this. It's like, 
you know, we're out here on tour, you know, trying to promote bad motor thing. Right. <laughs> And we'll keep doing that, but, you know, we're going to reissue Temple, too, because, you know, well, we know why, because, you know. Yeah. So they did, and then, and then it, 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 it did great. It got the audience and ears and the airtime that it deserved. Um, but Chris, anyways, became very prolific at this time, primarily because of the insight he got from Andy's. It's like, if they don't like it, they don't like it. If, if you know, if this doesn't fit with, the Temple Project Five does it fit with Soundgarden Five? Does it fit? Yeah, here, there it's just just keep writing, just keep doing it, and that's the thing. So, and he got really good at this. So, it, at one point where he might introduce five songs and we like two of them and we do them, that was the case. And the other three might sit around or he'd use them, maybe, maybe rewrite them and be, maybe they become his solo thing or or. Uh, yeah. But then later, he'd it. write five songs, and they're all great. We love to do all of them. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I find it so interesting. I mean, his um, almost in a sort of McCartney esque way, like how his style uh, seemingly changed, like writing wise, you know, like he, he it, was, it was like, uh, I guess when Euphoria Morning came out, it was obvious to a lot of folks and stuff then. But I mean, well, even early on, like songs like Sun Shower and stuff, it was like so interesting oh, yeah. how he could. Uh, yeah, he, well, you know, I mean, I think he just had so many musical, I mean, the, the, the diverse influences that he would quote to me were, I mean, it was all over the map. It was oh, yeah. uh, Costello and it was Rush and it was punk rock and it was yeah. Zeppelin Sabbath and it was, you know, it was like a lot of different styles. Of yeah. Music. Funny, um, you, just, you just said Rush. Yeah, Chris was a big Rush fan. Yeah. Especially as a drummer, of course, Matt Cameron. But I was actually, we mentioned growing up in Chicago, I was actually in Chicago. Uh, the previous weekend, okay, moderating the Chicago stop of Getty Lee's book tour. Oh no way! Oh, that's so cool. I said online, yeah, it was, oh. it was it was a blast to be back. You know, I, uh, it was a blast to be back in the town I grew up in. Saw a couple old friends, and yeah. uh, we were at the auditorium, and I got to come out and introduce Getty Lee, and then sit down in some nice, comfy chairs and discuss his uh his biography, My F and Life, is what. It's what it's called. It was, it was, it was a oh. absolutely just memorable, a wonderful experience. It was, it was just you know, some wow. laughter, some tears, and and it was, it was a great deal. That's so cool, man. He seems like he's like you know those guys have been through tragedy, obviously, but I mean both him and Alex seem like they're in a good place right now, and it's a uh, you know yeah you see them out there doing some things. And I saw Alex uh, recently played at Massey Hall uh, in. Uh, Toronto there at a, at a Christmas show got up with some friends and did some songs it's, that's awesome you know it's great to see them out doing some different things and, and, and it, yeah it, it was Chris and Matt that rekindled my affection for Rush you know mm -hmm. I mean you know I start getting you know I was into them when I was a kid in, in, in the 70s and I kind of kind of outgrow it go to college right my punk rock collection grows in my my 70s you know metal and classic rock collection kind of gets pushed gathers dust in the back yeah and, but yeah i mean chris chris and matt's um interest in rush certainly as great drummers is what really steered me back to like paying attention again i really feel like there's a I know they're not musically punk rock, but I feel like the spirit of Rush has such a punk rock. Um, you know, like Twenty One Twelve being <laughs> the album where the label was like, "You guys need to write some hits, or we're going to drop you." And they're like, "Okay," <laughs> and then they give them Twenty One Twelve, <laughs> and I just feel like they wanted to uh, live and die on their own terms and do their yeah. thing. So cool. I think that yeah, those God, just good people they are. Yeah, yeah, they seem like such a. Uh, I, did I answer the question about boot camp? It, by the way, yeah. I, so, so Chris wrote that. That eerie feel is probably some of the uh, some of the guitar, some of the um, color guitar voicings. That sort of like uh, guitar with um, some delay and the, the feedback and some wah uh, right on the riff. Wah. Yeah, um, uh, Chris was playing with that on the demo, so we had to try to voice some of those some of those. Uh, I think both he and I uh, probably dropped some of that in there. What it did, and I, and it's very clear to me that 
boot camp is dipping deep into the reservoir of of, of Pink Floyd and and its mm. influence on on Chris as a songwriter, and I think the elements of that uh, were asked in that question were those elements that give it that eerie uh, Pink Floyd sort of ambience, and it was the guitar wad and, and squeals and delay that 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 feedback at the end as it's yeah. tailing is so cool like the you know over the whole last it sounds like pushing the string into the pickup or something or like i don't know what it is but it's so cool you know it's part of with you um i mean i've you know uh had to learn quite a few of your your songs and riffs you know to to play with chris and i i must say i mean your style is so uh unique and and i appreciate it so much and um it's it's actually very difficult to uh to to uh try and do justice to what it is that you do you know on and it's it's real challenge because it's so unique and that kind of you know like how's he doing that <laughs> that sounds and you talk about like the solos or solos and parts like even just okay like i think about the beginning of um you know, uh, loud love is a good example, or like the feedback oh, or catching, yeah. or you know, like things like that. Like, just trying to, how do I get the right, like, just at the right angle and the right overtones? And you know, so that, that's interesting. That that was like, we couldn't do that live. So, so I tracked the feedback part in the studio. It was just the room we we're in, and you get this feedback humming, and you just kind of orient yourself toward the cabinet in a way that you can kind of control it. Yeah. Generally, feedback isn't something you want to control, but it is something you'd like to manipulate so you can make it turn and bend. Yeah. In this case, it was a particular melody. So I recorded the feedback melody, and then Chris decided, hey, but it's kind of, it's not clear. It's just like a word. So you give it um, a clarity of percussion. While I'm recording the feedback melody, Chris is figuring out he, he, it's it's four notes. Um, Got it. Yeah. I remember showing it to uh, to Tom Morello and brother Wayne Kramer when we played it at the Chris tribute in 2019. We mm -hmm. uh, we played that song with. Uh, I know Wayne Kramer played guitar. He was on my stage right, and Tom played on stage left and it was to me that was right up tom's alley it's like you know you can get a you can pull this off the volume pedal or or uh, or some of the delay effects that you use it just sound like something you do mm. there's is this so i'm doing this feedback and chris is in the control room he's like he's like oh here are the four notes here's the melody so he tracks those notes with the on on, on the similar pitch to fortify that sound. So rather than this is ambient blurriness, it uh -huh. now gives it more of a clarity as a as a part and as a melody. So we tried to do that live and we could play the melody part, but the feedback is going to change from room to room. And yeah. it was a hard thing to figure out. We were playing halls that were much bigger than the than the ISO booth we were in. So yeah. Well I experienced that myself. <laughs> Find the okay. Here we go. Here comes this one. I got lots of gain. And I stand. Oh, let's hope. Oh, not quite. Oh, I'm sliding around playing the melody, I but I got as close as I could. The best that ever sounded live was doing with uh, with uh, Tom and Wayne at the Chris tribute because yeah, because that that thing at the beginning, that feedback melody at the beginning. Once I showed the melody to Tom, it's really up his alley. It's like it's like this is yeah. Something pull off you know but also your your uh, you said solos i mean yeah for sure like uh you know the black hole sun solo or something which is kind of odd meter right and then it, but it's got this beautiful arc to it where you know trying to duplicate that actually when in our uh solo band with chris yogi would play that solo because i felt like it was he could capture a bit of the the, the sort of a little bit more avant-garde arc to it you know then i was always like you know a little more like uh i don't know i guess it's just the the getting used to playing in odd meters and stuff is an interesting thing and then soloing over it could be but you're great at that. i mean that's one of the things that you just well, you well sometimes if something's in an odd meter you're count, counting out something in seven or five while at the same time letting go and play something 
improv. You know, I'm not a jazz guy, so that's, that I can't do that. So sometimes it'll just come out in four, and I just remember where the one is. And so you might just be meandering. In I see. It's in standard tuning, but as long as I orient to where the one is, you know, you, you can just do whatever little splurt it is. Yeah. Just shove it out there and bend the note and bang, we, we re revisit the one if you're lucky, if I'm paying attention. So, <laughs> um, it's, it, yeah, play, playing playing riffs in weird time signatures really works with, you know, Soundgarden. Soloing that time signature is, uh, I think, is above my pay grade. So I would, my, 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 my thing was to just kind of improvise anyways. I, because it's not just a different time signature. It's a, a every damn song is a different tuning. Yeah, and yeah. This is something interesting. Well, we were doing Super Unknown, and I was tracking solos for I forget which song. It was some odd time signature. It might have been. I forget what it was, but often I would track the solos without um, anyone present except for Matt Cameron. I would request <laughs> Matt because Matt Matt's aesthetic sensibilities. Uh, with his experience with jazz and, and my interest in noise uh, would would work well. Like if, if I didn't like something and Matt said it was cool, I'd say, I don't know. I don't think, I don't, I don't think I'm flushing out, fleshing out a, a theme. Or I don't think it's going anywhere. Matt would say, no, I think it is. And he would explain it. And I would defer to him because his, his understanding of rhythm and, and, uh, some of these things I just, I just, I just trust it, you know. Sorry about that. Warm on there. Um, so, which, so oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, I, I just actually did look at the clock. I don't, I want to be cognizant of not keeping you too long. We've been going quite a while and I'm having such a great time, but I didn't want to, uh, it, 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 it's fine. It's sun, it's Sunday and uh, it's gray out. So, <laughs> talking guitar isn't so bad. <laughs> so, so, so at some point. Yeah. Um, Chris wasn't usually there, or or Ben, or or Hero. It was usually either just me and the engineer or producer. I emphasize engineer because you know when you're a rock band is doing original material, what do producers really do? Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't dance music. It isn't where you're hiring a singer and building beats around them, and you know, and then hot bringing in a symphony or some session dudes to fill it out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a rock band. You basically get a, a recording engineer and say, you know place the mics in places that capture, you know, the, the power of the band and you hope and, and there isn't too much input other than when you require a fresh pair of ears mm. to, uh, to uh, get an outside perspective on what it is you're doing. But so basically me and the recording engineer or, or Matt, and um, I became a much better guitarist and musician for really from working with Matt. I think I think the wow. whole band the whole band really improved because of Matt's abilities and insight. Um, and, and he's also very patient, and he's 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 got the personality of a of a of a, of a teacher and instructor. Perfect mm. person to run a clinic, right? I mean, perfect person to work with a rock school. Also. Right, right. <laughs> um, no, that's really interesting. I mean, it sounds like you would rely on him for uh, the, the basically like in a production capacity. You well, know? There, yeah, exactly. There, there are times because I'm self-critical and second guess myself as sure. you know, as Chris was, as Hero was, as Ben was. Uh, Chris kind of skirted the, the, the self-criticism was at times debilitating, you know, in the early days for Chris because he's self-conscious and self-critical that it really is his regard for Andy Wood's process as a songwriter, that when he embraced that, he became really prolific and and didn't marry himself emotionally to the material as much. He just let it be its own thing. That's so special. Would, I mean, that's how he Andy, his dog. <laughs> right. Sounds like he kind of set him free a little bit to just, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. just don't, yeah, that's really... Uh, and, uh, fascinating. He told me a story once. I'm just recalling um, about how 
you could tell me if you if if you remember this or not. Like um, sometimes you like to lie down on the floor, and he would set up a sound for you, and then hand you the guitar, and you like that, like to just have it <laughs> set up and then roll tape kind of thing. And just is that true? Yeah, it's, it's like it, it's like if I can play, yeah, with the with you know, given the sound that's dialed in, then I will, you know, yeah, uh, because the sound that's dialed in will influence how I might approach it. If I'm given um, a sound that's kind of bright and uh, crisp and percussive, I'm more inclined to play something that's a little bit more rhythmic or funky or uh, or mm. even kind of like like maybe even you know, sort of late '70s, uh, early '80s, sort of uh, new wave sort of that sort of spazzy sort of thing. If I was yeah. given something warm, I might be more inclined to play something heavy or bluesy or or, or uh, drony. So I would often approach the guitar by the by the sound I had and what felt right. But the worst thing in the world is to have someone dial in and I've said I've used this analogy plenty of times, but you know I, if you dial, if you gave me Elvis Costello's guitar, I'd probably approach songwriting in a way that was more singer songwriting. Give mm. me Alka's guitar, I'd do something different. But don't give me Elvis Costello's guitar and say, "All right, we're going to press record and you're going to start playing this Metallica song now." It's like, <laughs> I don't care if you think that's a great tone and that tone sits well in the song. It doesn't sit well on the fingers or on the fretboard. It's that song ain't going to happen. So right. that's the kind of argument I might have with a with a with a producer. I see. Yeah. Um, here's a fellow named Rummy. He says uh, he hears bits of Ace Freely and Tony Iommi in your oh, playing. Yeah. Would that be two early influences? Or yeah. Well, yeah. Definitely, definitely Ace because you know I was a Kiss fan when I was like 15, 16. So when I started learning how to play solos, I would play those little. Two string, you know those bends and the triplets. A bound down, bitter do. Yeah, you, you, where you, where uh, you, 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 it's like you finger the B string and then and then two frets up on the G and you bend up to like match the note and right. That, and, and then the other two string stuff that you might hear with like Chuck Berry and, and Ace would occasionally do. Um, I would do a lot of that my solos and, and my solos were far more rhythmic, you know, in my early bands like Identity Crisis and the Pinheads. And they, they were, they, they were, they weren't sloppy and they were, they were, they were sensible and they, and they fit with the groove of the song. The grooves are much easier. They're all four, four and it's standard tuning. It ties back to the, 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 the previous question of in, in one, in one case I'm in the studio and Chris comes in and I'm tracking a solo and he's rarely not there. He's seen me track solos and perform solos in the early days in standard tuning, E, or even drop D. And now we've got some song like Pretty News or, well, it's super unknown, I guess it'd be like My Wave or Dare Try to Live or, or Limo Rep. And he picks up one of the guitars and I'm I've got a few guitars on stand, so I'm trying to record with. He picks one up, starts playing it. And he realizes it's in the tuning of the song. Mm. And this really surprised the hell out of me, but he looks at me and he goes, are you are you soloing in the same tuning as the songs in? I go, yes. Ah, I, and and I go, why? And he goes, what do you think I was in standard tuning? He goes, he goes yeah. Go, why would you think that? And, and and he goes, I don't know. I just assumed you'd like play the leads and like just some irregular tuning. I yeah. think in the conversation that ensued. He's like, well, that's where the scales are, and that's where the box patterns are, and that's where here's the pentatonic, here, here's the whatever the the semitone, the the, the uh, diatonic. What it here's it here's the different patterns, and you've learned those. So you would just take the song and say, oh, this is in G, or this is in A, and you and you do that, or this is this is something minor. And I thought, ah, that would be a sensible thing to do, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, that's not going to work live, you know. Because right. it's in C G C G G E or whatever. It's like, it's like I I'm not running over and having my tech have me. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, I can relate. I remember learning uh, 
take uh, like suicide riff. I mean, uh, and you've yeah. basically got the middle three strings you can kind of solo on where you yeah. know where things are and then everything else is. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I had to solo like, yeah. you know, what I would, you know, play an arc of a solo, like what yours would be, I would attempt to. And I, I quickly learned where to go, <laughs> you know. The same with pretty deuce or head down, which are like weird C, G, C, G, G things or my yeah. way, which is E, E, B, 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 E. Uh, yeah. And Chris is like, you're soloing in that. What else am I going to do? Or live. So yeah. this is another thing. You know, I, I recently read this uh, online review. It's like, I don't know. Kim, I've seen Kim. I've seen him live. He's just kind of sloppy. I'm like, I started thinking, I play about eight different guitar tunings. Yeah. At some point, 30 years ago or more, the idea of patterns and bo box patterns and scales just just threw it out the window. It's like I'm not. I I now have to relearn the song and the neck visually as well well as orally. We're in this weird tuning, like pretty new. So it's like, what was that one? Was that a the same tuning as uh, as uh, burden in my hand? Which uh, yeah, so that's a CG CG. E? Yeah, where's the that e on top? Right, I have I have a guitar here somewhere still, that has the tuning still written still. on it. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things my uh, my tech sent me a PDF, and I have it in front of me now. Check this out. Oh, brilliant! Um, that's probably what I should have done. <laughs> yeah, e -G 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 -E. so go. so anyways i'm soloing and and what occurred to me is that everything i'd learned when i was younger that i taught myself about you know scales or patterns those are no longer factors because we're coming up with our own tunings or 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 making shit up or adjusting things yeah, I'm going to play in that. So now I have to I have to play more by ear, and visually I look at the song. I look at the net. There's that chord. There's this chord. And I picture where the chords are. I picture where the notes are, and then you orient. The first thing you do in any tuning is orient the octave, right? Okay. So drop D is like, oh, the octave is you know you can kind of the E and D strings are you know spread apart. Rusty Cage, you know. Uh, the E and A strings, you're just just uh, a whole step you know, up to the A string. You orient the the octave, and then you can start getting all the other notes in there if you need to be. So it sort of gives you a home base, like yeah, exactly. on each string, or you can you're you're looking at the chords and going, okay, here's my safe tones. Yeah, and I can if yeah. I need to get back out of a exactly you know, a jam. And then, like, and then, like in the in the uh, pretty noose tuning or the or the my way tuning. You get some your know, dual strings. You know, get some two Bs, you know, a couple of Gs, and I could play those and drone on the. I could play the Gs and drone on the Cs. I leave the C open, and I could just kind of run up and down the neck. And now I start looking at the neck, and you start learning the patterns. You know, you just look at the neck, and I, I go here and as I ascend. Sure. These are notes I can play, and I can throw in these half steps now and then, and it kind of twists it into like a little different mode here and there. I don't know what the mode is. It's by ear, it's by eye, and you 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 just kind of learn these patterns of the songs, and that's how I play. Now, if you're <laughs> if you're playing four or five songs in that same weird tuning, but the songs are in different keys, and you're you, you kind of gotta remember the different patterns, and yeah, sometimes you miss them, especially after a few beers. But yeah. the, actually, I also I like I said, I threw. I threw being within the lines and within the borders out the window years yeah. before. And I thought, you know, a lead to me was not a melodic exploration of themes as a lot of metal guys do it and maybe as some jazz guys do it. To me, a guitar solo was improvisation. This is, this is either where you're being expressive or... Um, Either expressive emotively, or or perhaps you're being expressive, you know, aesthetically. So if you're not dressing the emotions, you're you're dressing the 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 ideas or the the feeling of a song. And in that case, 
it's going to be different from day to day. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. so so rather than having a, a distinct pattern, you have a general outline, and then you kind of move around in there. I liked what I did last time. I want to do more of that, but then go here. And so, even at a young age, it was like this is improvisation. You're you're making it up. This is yeah. you in that moment, and. And that's kind of the way Ben played. It's the way Hero played. They jam, and so and Matt would anticipate where it was going. And that's the kind of band we were. So, you know, if if you hit, it's transcendent and it's mm -hmm. over the top. And if you miss, it's like ah, drunken stumble. It's like whatever. That's that's that's. It wasn't as bad as as like the replacements, you know, where either they're either they, <laughs> they fall apart or they're or they're brilliant. But it is. It is that. It, it is punk rock. It's a little bit of blues. It's a. It's it's noise. It's it's. This is the liberty, the the, the freedom within a song that has structure. So you bouncing between understanding this structure of a weird time signature and a, and a, and a weird tuning, and then yeah. letting yourself go in a tuning that you're only familiar with on a handful of songs. Is is both fun and a challenge, and I totally love the opportunity to do that. And I love that Soundgarden was a kind of band where I could do that. I love that 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 Ben's doing that on bass, and so is here. Yeah. They're totally doing different stuff. Yeah, I mean that kind of that ethos and aesthetic just like uh, is so special and cool to me, and it's like sort of the antithesis of a lot of what's going on today there's a lot of live shows i mean not that you know one's better than the other it's a different thing but there's a lot of emphasis these days on kind of putting on a show and it's very you know to tracks and it's a certain you know there's a you're, you're to a click and it's very that's very similar every day and there's a time and place for both i guess but man i sure love the freedom of the the uh we don't know what's gonna happen let's see yeah. that's I, like just so wonderful i, you know? I like that you know, car careening out of control. I don't, not an actual car, but that metaphor of a car careening out of control, just over, just over the edge. The wildness, the chaos. These are elements that are just so integral to rock. I mean, going yeah. to the earliest days. I mean, yeah. This, yeah. this is important, and it, it, it just, I just kind of feel that the compulsion toward you know, radio as an audience and record labels targeting that just always cut those corners and rounded those edges all the time. Yeah. Think about the, the, the amazing records that I, that blew me away, even when I was a teenager, just shifting from, you know, uh, bands like Aerosmith and Nugent and Kiss, and then hearing things like Velvet Underground or the Stooges. Mm. Well, that first MC5 album absolutely changed my understanding of how to approach, um, guitar playing and and the idea of rock and roll it's like that that album is is it's it's solid but it's also wild and the wildness there's this chaos and there's that out of control thing that's it's this intense explosion it's like that's dangerous that's fucking rock and then yeah man that element was present in so much punk rock and, and indie and not all of it not all of it but a lot of it, especially in the bands I love, like you know Meat Puppets and Black Flag and and the Minutemen. As a matter of fact, Chris and Hero and I, in our early days, if we fucked up and it was a mistake, mm. the ensuing error would be referred to as a train wreck. Dude, you missed that. You missed that change. You know, and then I followed you. We fucked it. Train wrecked that song. It's like, oh yeah, but. Yeah. If you fuck up and it opens up another another way of hearing that song or that part. Yeah. That was like a serendipitous benefit to the song and to the playing. And we've yeah. called those meat puppets fuck ups. <laughs> you listen to the first Meat Puppets album, which is this brilliant, like psychedelic hardcore with, with this Neil Youngish country thing going on. And then you hear the second Meat Puppets album where it's more clearly, uh, you know, a dead Neil Young, Hendrix, punk hmm. rock thing. There's there's a looseness. I mean, you know, people have called it sloppy, but it's a looseness 
that adds that kind of element of wild and chaotic and trippy and beautiful. And Chris and Hero, is that, is that a Chris or Hero coined the term meat puppets fuck up? And we always use that term. And so that's awesome. I've heard it said that mistakes are opportunities, you know, and I think. <laughs> so if you hear that, hey, look at this. Oh, there we go. So, so if you hear that, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, the meat puppets fuck up, man. No, that was cool. That was cool. Yeah. Whatever you did there, do it again. It's like, ha, do it again. Now it wouldn't be a meat puppets fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, the last part of the question here is about, because um, I haven't asked you anything about this, but I did want to just touch on it for a second. Uh, Rummy said, how did you get into Mesa amps? I know you're a longtime user of Mesa amplifiers, but as well as the PV VTM120, which I had to ask you about uh, that period. And because uh, that would have been bad motor finger and stuff, right? I think so. Yeah. Um, there are a couple things that went into the decision making. You know, ideally, the, the sound I liked, especially in the early days, I kind of flipped the pickup sounds like. Like my when I played rhythm, I like to use a neck pickup. Hmm. I, I, I think that's because where you get some of the things you can do be behind the tail and the hmm. brightness, a little bit more percussive and rhythmic. When I soloed, well, sorry, that's a bridge pickup. I, so I play rhythm in a bridge pickup. Oh, got it. I soloed I like to go the neck pickup because warmer, kind of more buttery and smooth, which that is awesome. usually people are playing rhythm the neck pickup and then they go to the bridge pickup to cut through but i i played the other way just not that's just what i did until i realized that it was backward where I, it probably would have been something where chris pointed out it's like so you're flipping the pickup there when you're soloing he's like yeah he goes is that what people do and i go i think so <laughs> <laughs> it's what i do <laughs> and that that changed when chris started playing guitar so okay. I would like to have gone down to the neck pickup, but if Chris, if the, if Chris's rhythm guitar is there, then if I'm soloing if the ne on a neck pickup, that's not cutting through. Mm. So I switched to the bridge pickup, um, and eventually I introduced the wah wah because then I could be on the neck pickup and have that buttery smooth sort of feel to it, and then hit the wah wah and you know, get the cut. Yeah, get the cut. The, yeah. Uh, but that those are all things I had to adjust. Uh, to uh, play leads around Chris's um, rhythm guitar being present now. It changed my style, but um, if I was a solo, if I was the solo guitarist in the band, hmm. that's what I'd be doing. I'd be soloing on the neck pickup. And Got it. The rhythm on the bridge. So okay. the, the uh, PVs had that kind of brightness and warmth that, I, I would normally gravitate toward those old Fender tweeds. You know, I, I just, I, it, just, you crank those and it just did this nice warm thing. Oh, cool. Um, and the PVs, I would try to, you know, I, I think the PVs and the Mesa Boogies had these settings in the back of the head where you can adjust it for, I think the terms they used were modern or vintage, I think was. That might have been on the boogie. Uh, I think the PV had some some settings like that, and I would switch things to vintage just because mm. I'm not. That isn't the type of music we're playing, but it is my sound. It was just warmer, uh, maybe more bluesy, more maybe darker, maybe uh, more buttery. And I didn't like the modern sounds, which are more percussive. But mm. apparently, and we learned this from. Uh, I think we toured the PV plant, and uh, the the guys there told us, I asked, why can't we get, why aren't there amps? Do you have a line that is more warmer, more, more bluesy, or more uh, um, some of that classic rock warmth or, or, you know, and they said, well, because Van Halen went through the roof and everyone wanted to get their guitars to sound like Van Halen. Uh -huh. They want things to be bright and they wanted it to, have these features and a little bit percussive and then uh the thrash got big and metallica went through the roof and slayer and, and again people wanted something that was bright and percussive but also had a low wolf but they wanted that that top to you know to cut and be visceral so I, and then i said i don't want 
to sound like Metallica or Slayer. I don't want to sound like Van Halen. We don't do anything like that. How do I dial it in? And it would usually be the vintage setting and all this. I thought, oh. and it, the deal was is is Chris liked things a little bit brighter anyway. So mm. uh, if he liked it, and I'd say, you know, that, that's fine. I, I I am not into shopping for gear. You know, if it doesn't do what I'd like it to do, then I don't want it. If it can do what what feels comfortable to me, and I can play guitar in a way that feels comfortable to me, then fine, let's take it. Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to go out looking for it. If it doesn't do it, put it away. You know, if, if, Seems if, clear. Yeah. So uh, PV could do that, and we got the deal with them. So it was perfect for touring because we now have us stacks of PV heads that we can bring out, and if yeah. one bus. You can you got backups and it's great for tour support. And the same deal with boogies. Uh, one thing that initially gravitated t- me toward boogies, uh, I think a lot of people have thought it was like the Metallica thing, you know. Um, I think they, the Bay Area thing, I, 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 didn't they use boogies at some point? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what it was for me and John Marshall, I believe John Marshall, who played in Metal Church and, um, you know, we were, we were friends back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I think since moved on, got married. But he also played with Metallica. When when James uh, burnt his arm or whatever. Oh, yeah. Uh, Marshall would come out and play James's parts. And he played Metal Church and Metallica. And John, I believe, is a rep for Boogie now. Oh. Uh, I believe so. So I always orient Boogie to the Bay. Whenever I think of Mesa Boogie, the first thing I think of is Carlos Santana. And I sure. love the sound. I love his tone. When I think back on the Braxis and, and you know, and, and and some of the other his compositions or or the Peter Green song, you know, uh, uh, Black Magic Woman. Yeah. And when and that and then I thought, okay, that's that's a tone I can live with. I like, you know, it, it has a percussive thing that cuts through, but it's warm and it has that. That sort of vintage feel. So uh, same yeah, yeah. So yeah. We went with boogie because of versatility, and and uh, etc. That totally that totally makes sense. Um, one here from Cavalry Kendrick just asking about remembrance or thoughts on the Lemo Wreck riff, which is awesome. Oh my god! I <laughs> I specifically uh, my text sent me the uh. I, Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Josh. They <laughs> sent uh, the tuning charts specifically because I was like, fuck, I'm trying to remember 4th of July and I'm trying to remember Limo Rec. Yeah. So 4th of July is on here and Limo Rec is not. Oh, okay. Um, there's a couple reasons. Uh, th- this particular chart is from 2012. And in 2014, that's when we did the 20th anniversary of Super Unknown. And oh, yeah. The yeah. song. Uh, top to bottom we play the album top to bottom yep. so we learned songs that were not regular parts of our set and at that point we we got the tuning charts for those and everything so so yeah i think though hold on a second i think limo rec was was a drop cg i think i think God, is it drop CG or is it drop DG? Drop C and G. There's a few other songs on the record with that tuning, right? That particular. I seem to remember Limo Rec as being distinct. And, and that may only be because of the harmonics. And pulling mm-hmm. the harmonics off in a tuning that wasn't standard was, you know, was more of an adventure trying to figure out everything was. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It, it was either. Yeah, it, it must have been. It must have been CG uh, because I know DG, or what we call Digga Digga, was you know like Super Unknown and uh, a Birth Ritual were in that tuning, and Limo Rec was unique at that time. So I think it was CG DG. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. God, what a record, man! I've got a great memories of playing uh, the song Super Unknown live. Oh, that's- <laughs> that song. With so much, that riff is so much fun to play, and it's just so. Oh God, it was 
so much. I, I, I agree. I think it's just because it naturally fits where a guitar's guitarist fingers would go. Just the yeah, little, you yeah. have ones, yeah, yeah. It's that nice familiar box pattern, only approached just a little bit differently. Yeah. So yeah, it, it would fit in there with your with your with some of your Zeppelin riffs or or, uh, or yeah, Bill Five by the Beatles, you know. Yeah, and just the, yeah, Zeppelin-y, I guess it is with the, with the it's kind of bluesy, but it's also modal. You know, even the chorus <laughs> with the half step on the is so cool. Like it's like uh, just special. There, there's a bunch of other chords that I came up with around that around that uh, that riff. They're like God, there must have been six or seven different parts, and then when Chris wrote lyrics for them. He removed a couple of the parts I'd come up with, but added uh, one or two of his own, um, and because it fit the the lyrical melody ideas he had, I remember thinking, "Oh man, that one thing was so fun to play. You got to bring that back in here." But yeah. then it would have been, you know, like uh, like nine different guitar parts. But <laughs> in that tuning, it's just you know, once I. The, two, the octave position is the same on the E and E and D strings as it is on the A and uh, G strings. So, yeah, it's just just droning the octave, the other strings open. There's the possibilities are just great, and it's trippy and psychedelic. So I came yeah. up with all these parts, and but I love the final version. So, so I, I tip my hat to Chris for ditching some really goddamn cool guitar parts <laughs> and replacing with some cool vocal accompaniment parts because it made the, it, it work. It worked. It worked brilliantly. It's really neat. I mean, even the yeah, I, I know what you, I could hear like the descending, the way the song ends, like the way the the riff at the end. It's like that could just keep going for another. Yeah. <laughs> could be a whole nother because it's just like this is fun. Like as soon as you drop the, the 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 fifth string to g it's just like oh that's interesting and then all this yeah. other stuff opens up yeah exactly. it's really fun i think chris wrote that chorus part the one that does throws that half step there the bent bang do, 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 do. yeah yeah There's, it might have been a variation on one of the uh, other riffs that got kicked out that I... but it has that it's on that oct it's that octave thing on the uh yeah we you know, that thing da, yeah. da, 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 da. Yeah. it's so cool you know it's and then crazy. and then the uh the, the pre-chorus are the octaves i believe i do the octave on the on the uh on the a and g strings for other uh, little chord chord voicings that that might I, I forget which part it is i have to actually start playing it remember but no that i love that tuning it's yeah yeah for a while i just always kept the guitar around of that tuning just because of the the uh the the the, the, the octave aspect, yeah you know. yeah that yeah. <laughs> so great yeah so much fun yeah i was thinking the I'm pick the, matt introduced that tuning to the band by the way with both your tools. oh did he yeah and so what do you introduce Birth to that, and I think I used I wrote the riffs for new damage on that, and then super unknown. It's so great. It's that the the end uh, the uh, <laughs> that's it. That thing it just sounds like you can just keep going and building. I remind you of the Hollies, long cool woman. Oh yeah, yeah, one of the best guitar riffs ever. Oh, yeah, that holy. is yeah, yeah. I've I loved love that, that riff since I was eleven or twelve. Just just love that sound of that super underrated guitar riff yeah long cool woman in black dress yeah um god so many great questions here once again i know we've been going for a long time we should we should wrap it up soon get dinner and oh, that's a good question. uh, uh th this fella travis was just asking um you mentioned earlier you're trying to break out of power chords and do other things did you just study new chords and find a place to fit them or was it some other technique um here hold on the shadows are getting weird no that's too uh it was a, it was a different tuning. So it was the fact that the guitars were at different tunings. Yeah, I just just mm -hmm. couldn't play um, power chords or or you know th those those power fives or the or the bar chords. It, it just wouldn't work in, in C G C G G E or E E B B B or whatever. It's a uh, uh, so you so you 
you'd voice things differently. Now, now um, there are bar chords, uh, power chords in Pretty News, but they're basically just one finger across the uh, fret and, and they're tuned to an open, uh, open chord. So that was fairly straightforward. Yeah. Uh, by the way, in the early days, I very specifically and consciously didn't want to play power chords or bar chords because it was everything I'd done in the bands before. It was the Ramones. It was, it was uh, you know, Sex Pistols. It was ACDC and Kiss. And the way I wrote songs was that way. I'd write, you know, um, you know, just just your G to A and C to D or you know A D and A E. You know, thinking of wild thing, Louis Louis. And I'd write vo you know vocal melodies and lyrics for that. That was very easy for me to write lyrics, and it was very easy to write songs. It's very tough for me to write Soundgarden songs. I can write Soundgarden riffs all day and all night. I can pick up a guitar and come up with musical instrumental ideas all the time. Yeah, but coming up with lyrical ideas and arrangements was was like this. It was a different impediment because not being a drummer, the, my my facility around the the timing and it was and, and the tunings used it's 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 just a little bit different and 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 yeah you could definitely see the benefit that like that the the uh, the, the, the drum talents that Chris or Matt would have would definitely be beneficial in in, mm -hmm. in approaching that. So in order to come up with an arrangement for a song, you really need to it really comes in after the lyrics and yeah. uh, writing lyrics and weird time signatures is is a different thing and also the feel of Soundgarden being dark and uh, and moody that is an integral part of my temperament and my personality but it is not a, a, a way i write the way uh, uh in terms of words or lyrics it is a little bit more uh I think in the, in the early days is a little bit more, uh, <laughs> a little bit more snarky. The kind of thing you might find in uh, in uh, uh, some kind of punk rock or, or new age stuff or new mm -hmm. age. Stuff. So, uh, in the, so what I would do is I would respond to ideas that Kiro might have on a bass line. So he wrote a bass line that kind of wandered and it would kind of have these cool little melodies. Well, I'm not going to shadow that with, with chords or power chords. It freed me up to play, you know, come up with a counter melody that would wind around it or just play arpeggios. So if he's playing a, a line that's descending and I would just kind of play three or four string arpeggios and fill it in with other tones or things like, feedback or harmonics mm -hmm. so now what i'm doing is i'm kind of filling in dynamic uh, filling in uh guitar ideas around a bass line that chris comes up with lyrics and that determines where the song is going to be arranged in terms of where and i would follow that i kind of drop back dynamically while chris is singing the verse and then in between the verses during the smell breaks and i i, I I drop that same pattern, maybe down an octave and play more heavy and bendy, and then go up yeah. a little more percussively. Maybe I drop this to harmonic. So I'm now, I, I love this opportunity yeah. to not just write songs that are power chords, but to uh, come up with single note riffs, which is not something I did. It, it was all it was all power chords. And writing Sabbathy type riffs was not something that I was inclined to when I was younger, but now I could do that with Soundgarden. I could say, okay, I'll play this, Chris will sing that, and while he's singing that, I'll kind of, I'll drop back a bit or play this accent and then come back into the riff later or go somewhere else. So between what, fitting in around Chris's, around Hero, a winding bass riff of Heroes, and then the dynamic of the vocal, I started doing things like arpeggios and harmonics, and then out came the beneath the bridge thing. It's like, well, this is this dynamically is going to be a little more drawn back. So maybe I hit a harmonic and just kind of bend it and let it kind of hang and just squeal, you know. And so different things started happening. And I very specifically 
I think Chris wrote a song that had some power chords in it. I looked at him and I looked at Hero and I said, I don't want to play bar chords or power chords. That's something I've done, you know, the previous eight, nine years of my life. And this, with the way we're writing here, it's an opportunity for me to approach guitar differently and songwriting differently in response to you guys. I can present ideas that that will that you guys will be able to fill in similarly and i like that it's freed me up a lot but the minute i play power chords it's going to limit limit me dynamically and it's going to limit the different uh melodies or or harmonies i can you know it's, it's just all framed by those three three uh, notes as opposed to just playing one note then i can play a, totally makes sense i mean it's so uh and it's so uh you know intrinsic to the sound of the songs and what turned out you know it's like that kind of creativity and you uh willing to and, and that's kind of comes all the way back around to the chemistry of the band and how you, you just wouldn't have the same thing with anyone there's, there's no better example in Soundgarden. if anybody's different i mean obviously there's the hero version you know and then yeah. and then there's ben you know but every they, everybody brought so much to the table with these different parts and different sort of approaches uh and ended up you end up with you know magic on records so well, well you're right I mean, when hero didn't play guitar so he wrote on bass so that freed me up to put the guitar in somewhere uh ben writes on guitar primarily mm -hmm. um chris on guitar matt on guitar so i kind of have to learn and they're all self-taught so yeah. i'm enough of a weirdo but these mm -hmm. you know, ben's got some pretty unique approaches to guitar on his own that are they're very just they're not they're not uh the kind of like turn this way <laughs> they're they're not um they're they're definitely stylistically different from from the way i might approach things sure um, and the same with chris you know so with hero i'm kind of filling in i'm, I'm doing what I'm, I'm playing guitar putting the guitar i'm writing guitar around where the bass go if 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 uh ben's running a guitar part i can spend a lot of time learning to attack the guitar like he does and then come up with color parts that might be more along my personality to flesh out certain certain things so uh, that's interesting that, um, when you wanted to break out of power chords you just study new chords to find a place to fit them so uh we started with power chords as not being part of the approach. Power <laughs> chords started being introduced later when Chris started playing more guitar and started writing. So yeah. he'd start writing power chord and bar chord things. And uh, so I've, I've kind of, at that point, he kind of stuck. So I've listened to this is the song. So I'm going to put that there. But if it's in a weird tuning, then it's different because it's not going to be a regular position, you know, bar chord or whatever. Sure. And so that's the breaking out of power chords thing. A was sort of a, a foundational part of the band, and B, it's all the different tunings just did not facilitate making traditional bar chords or power chords. So cool, so cool. We should probably wrap it up pretty soon. I think um, uh, this has been amazing. Um, there's a few other uh, uh, comments, super chats that came through here. Ray play music. <laughs> super unknown as in my top five, five, whatever, five favorite albums ever me too <laughs> and he's asking if you recorded on a sofa <laughs> you know it's really funny um the the studio x that we played in the big room there's something about it that was, it was very professional and the way the lighting was was very you know it was they would record you know orchestras and, and strength mm -hmm. sections and they they do recordings for commercials audio and tv commercials you know radio and tv commercials so it was designed in a way that was kind of you know a little bit more corporate and kind of kind of cold a little bit because it's it's it's, it's a it's a professional recording studio that doesn't have the quirks of a uh, of, of, of personality driven creative thing <laughs> uh, 
So I would go out to trap and I was like, this feels just weird. I kind of feel like I'm in like a, from a, a school, a junior high multi-purpose room just standing here trying to play a song that is trippy and dark and yeah. or it's just, it just doesn't feel right. So the next day I come in and they've turned off all the lights and put in actual lamps lamps cool. with, uh, shades and everything and they moved and tried moving the couches into the big room this is the this is the drum room and they drew, <laughs> tried the couch in there and put on some throw pillows and then they put <laughs> a little end table for my beer and ashtray and and, and these light shades um <laughs> and like there you go kim just like your house, <laughs> and down and play. But this this may be dropping soon. I'm gonna have to, yeah. My, my this amp, it's got a low battery thing. Oh, okay. Well, we should sign off then. <laughs> I was um, gonna see if I can grab my plug. I should have plugged in, but well, anyway, we, went, we went, I, I did not. I did not record. It was a fun place to sit in and hang out and drink beer. But I ended up doing a lot of recording in the control room. We just dim the lights, and I could I could talk to the. Uh, uh, engineer to Michael Beinhorn and Jason Cassaro directly as I as we track. It was so, all taped then; nothing was digital. So I wanted to be in the room when he'd say, "Right there, let me re let me re punch me in there or, or or rewind. Let me try that again." So everything was taped. We had to rewind the machine. And yeah, we had to rewind and wait till they said, "Go." The good old days. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, 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 just can't shred says no question just want to say head down is one of my favorite songs ever me too <laughs> i will say that for the longest time the standard tuning of my guitar sitting in my living room was drop d it still is but the other standard tuning guitar that's always sitting around is the head down tuning cg cg G, e uh -huh. so i have two guitars one is always set to head down tuning i love writing in that tuning i just love the way it sounds and the other guitar is always in drop D. And it's such a great tune. All the crazy noises at the beginning and everything. Oh, we were yeah. going to learn that and play it in Chris's band. And I don't think we ever did. But I remember I've got a memory of sitting backstage in Dallas going over it and trying to listen to the intro and going, what's going on here? I wrote A Thousand Days Before in that tuning. I wrote Never the Machine Forever in that tuning. Oh, I wow. love that tuning. Yeah, head down. That's Ben's song. But he showed that tuning to me. And I was like, I just fell in love with it, and, and I write that tuning all the time. So. Well, I don't want to lose you before I say goodbye here. So yeah. everybody check out the guitars, the um, the S100s. There, there's a link in the video description below. This is a really beautiful guitar. It's got uh, killer tones. The phase switch, that's fun. Knock the pickups. Oh, and we lost Kim. <laughs> ah, did you? Or, or at least the video. So, But I can still hear you. So, yeah, I'm back. Oh, oh, there we go. You're back. Okay, I'm going to sign off. Hang for a second, and I'll say goodbye to you. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to stop the screen. Much, I'm I'm sorry uh, uh, to the folks there if I missed a, a few super chats and stuff, but um, yeah, we've been going for two and a half hours, so it's probably time to wrap it up. And I gave long-winded answers to straightforward questions. It so was we, so brilliant we, and wonderful. We you. Uh, we'll do it again in the future, Pete. Yeah, we must we must do it again. I I can't thank you enough. It was just a, a blast. So. Um, Hang for one second. I'll say goodbye and I'll I'll sign off the stream right now. Thanks you guys so much. We'll see you back next week for Sunday Live at the regular time, eleven forty-five a.m. Pacific. Thanks.